Happy Sunday morning, everyone. Welcome to a Sunday edition of the Lawn Care live stream. My name is Ron Henry, and I am here to help answer your lawn care questions. If this is the first time you are gracing us with your presence, welcome. Super happy to have you here. Now, you guys may notice that we're just doing a live stream um, this morning, mainly because today I was planning to go out and mow and stream outside and have a lot of fun doing that, because I thought it was going to rain for just a little while this morning. But it turns out that what I thought was going to be, uh, you know, an hour's worth of rain is turning into all day rainfall. So not to be defeated, I said, you know what, it's kind of impromptu, but why not? We'll just get online and see if anyone has any anything going on in their lawn that we can chat about. If not, we can just hang out for a little bit, maybe 30 minutes, an hour. We'll see how we'll see how this goes again. Um, the plan was to do this, do a stream outside, but uh, but that got that got canceled due to Mother Nature. So let's see who we have in the show tonight. Guys, as always, we're gonna be coming to you guys on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Everything should be working, so we'll see. And uh, let's see who we got in the, in the stream tonight. We got Jackie Bear, Brother Ron, what's going on, Jackie? You know, I can always count on you, Jackie, no matter what. I mean, it's I'm not sure what, what kind of alerts you have set up, but literally, as soon as I post uh, that I'm going live on a, on, a, on a show, on a stream, it could even be in the future, you're always the first one to comment. So whatever you're doing to, to keep tabs, uh, it's definitely working. Hopefully you guys are doing well. Also on Instagram, we got, let's see here. We got United Contracting Lawn Care, Frenchie Jojo. What's going on, Jojo? Hopefully you're doing well. Uh, Tracy, Shauna saying Sunday stream morning. Yeah, so again, the plan was to mow today, guys, but uh, but this was, was to mow and to stream it, but this is what I, um, I'm looking at outside. This is right before the stream started. So I'd like to say that that's going to go away here fairly soon, but it's going to, you know, that, that rainfall, looking at the forecast, it's, it's going to be that way all day, it looks like. So, so much for getting to play in the lawn today. But we can still chat, chat right? Hopefully some of you guys, if you're in Georgia as well too, you're also rained out. You're not going to do a whole lot. So we can, uh, we can hang out here and chat about lawn care for a bit. We also got uh, Chris Style 405 in the house saying, yo, what's up? 
I told Jackie, I said, Jackie, it just might be you and me today, man. And he says, you know, because this was just this was unplanned. He said, that's all we need. That's all we need, right? It's like, okay, from Key and Peel. And uh, yeah, guys, so um, first of all, for, for the winners of the, of the contest on Friday that won, um, you know, the best stripes, uh, best lawn stripes, uh, congrats again to Devin and Robert. Again, you guys' lawns were awesome. We've already... Um, got everything set up to get your prizes, the the carbon kits shipped out to you guys. So look out for that this week. Um, it will likely ship um, tomorrow on Monday, and then it'll be to you guys in a few days. So uh, so that so so you know enjoy that. All right, we got Sean Murphy. Good morning from Tampa. What's going on, Sean? Hopefully you're doing well in uh, in Tampa. I have some you know I have some some friends that live in Tampa. So yeah, it's cool cool. I'm not seeing you on the Friday night show, so maybe. Uh, whenever I stream on Friday nights, it's not convenient for you. So I don't, I don't recall seeing your, um, your name. Or if you do, you haven't, you don't comment. Or I'm just really bad at remembering names. Maybe you comment all the time, and I'm, and I'm just, I'm the one messing it up. All right. So we got Mary J saying, "What, uh, what a great Sunday treat! I just finished pulling up four dwarf uh, bushes that are no longer <laughs> dwarf and move them to the backyard patio area." Yeah, it's, it's a funny thing, man. You know, it's funny how, um, how much of a difference a plant that started out small and gets bigger, what kind of an effect it can have on, on your lawn program, you know, on your lawn, how, how, how well your grass grows. It's funny, this, uh, yesterday, uh, two um, folks in the neighborhood, like right down the street from me, were top dressing, you know, and today worked out exactly perfect for them because, you know, they were saying, oh, it's going to rain a little bit tomorrow, so I'm going to get my top dressing done today. And uh, it's working out better, than I think, than they expected. So the guy down at the, the corner, uh, Matt, he was uh, top dressing, he was using the SoQ leveling mix, Looking really good, and um, you know he's fighting a little bit of shade on his vanity strip, uh, but uh, but overall he did a really nice job with um, with his top dressing. And then up the street from him, Russ was doing some top dressing. He was just going the hundred percent sand route, and uh, again, I, with all the rainfall we're having today, that's going to settle in nicely. Maybe maybe um, what I can do is later on today, if it stops raining, I maybe can just drive by and I can take a quick um, YouTube story and I can show you guys what their uh, what the top dressing work what the top dressing work um, looks like after after all the rainfall. But yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, good morning, Chris. Hopefully you're doing well, sir. And then we got Jacob acted in the house saying, uh, good morning, Jess. I'm here. I'm new here and hoping to learn how to up my lawn game. Yeah, man. So Jacob, it's as far as getting your lawn game up, it really depends on where you're starting from. You know, I kind of sound like a broken record at this point, but really it's, uh, you know, it's control the weeds in your lawn, get a soil test done, fertilize your lawn based on those soil test results. And then it's just a lot of mowing. You know, all things uh, being equal, he or she who mows most will win. So that's um, that's really what it comes down to. So when I say a lot of mowing, what do, what do I mean? Like the minimum, the, the 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 minimum barrier for entry. If you're trying to have, you know, a lawn that stands out is twice per week mowing. Which to a lot of people that are that are new to lawn care may say that sounds you know it sounds like a lot, sounds kind of crazy. Um, but that's really what it takes. You know, you think about it. Once you get past getting getting the weeds under control in your lawn. Um, and, and a good nutrient program. If you think about what separates a golf course or the appearance of a golf course rather from a residential lawn, the, the biggest thing is a lot of the mowing that they do. Like they mow way more than, um, than, than we do on, on our home lawns. You figure that greens get mowed every day. Um, on most courses, uh, fairways get mowed every other day. You know what I mean? So I'm talking about getting to mow just twice a week. So just taking it from once, once a week or once every two weeks, which is what a lot of people do, to twice a week, uh, is um, is going to make a big difference in the way your lawn looks. As a general rule, if your lawn looks like it needs to be mowed, you waited too long. So if you look at your grass, you're like, you know what, it's looking a little, looking a little long. I could probably knock this down a little bit. You waited too long. It should look like whenever, whenever you, whenever you're doing it right and you mow, just a little bit should come off. Just, just a small amount of clipping should come off, and that's going to really give you your lawn that manicured look because you're not like you're not hacking a lot of, a lot of leaf off every time you cut it. You just take a little bit off. And uh, that that results in a, a lawn that has you know a very a very manicured appearance. A lawn that looks like let me see if I can show you one of the winners. So this was guys if you haven't watched from if you haven't watched the show from Friday, uh, this was R um, Robert's lawn. Let's see if I can find it. I think I still got it here. I think so. Yep, this is it. So this was the winner of the um, best stripes lawn. And the big thing that Robert does, yes, he has a great nutrient program. Yes, he uses fungicides, insecticides. He does all the, does all the things. He fertilizes pr according to soil test results. But the big thing is that Robert mows his lawn a whole lot, as is apparent by the stripes. So that, that if you want a lawn that looks like that, get your nutrient program in order, but then mow it a lot. That's that's going to be uh, the big thing. And even for you guys that say, you know, well, I don't have a real mower. Real mowers are, are you know, I'm not quite there yet. I'm not ready for that level of commitment just yet. 
I got you covered. So I'm gonna give you, an ex we're gonna take away that excuse because we have Devin who won the best cool season lawn. This is mowed with a rotary mower. So this is the, how his lawn looks. And that's, I think that most of you, if you have a cool season lawn, you know, would would uh, would take that. Well, this looks pretty sweet, right? I mean, even with a rotary, he was able to put some stripes in it, mow a nice little pattern in there, and it was good enough to win him best cool season lawn. So whether you got a rotary or a real mower, no excuses, you can still get an amazing lawn you know, just use, use what you have. Now, if you do have, if you have, um, you know, Bermuda, zoysia, rye grass, I mean, if you, if you have lawns or have a grass type that, that benefits or does, does well at lower cutting heights, you are going to get a better look from a real mower, but it's also more involved. I mean, they, they tend to be more expensive. There's more maintenance involved. Um, that, you know, you, you got to be on at least twice a week mowing. I mean, with a real mower, you're really every two days, every two, three days, you know, at, 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 at um, is what most people are doing. So, uh, so the level of commitment goes up, but the appearance of the lawn looks a lot better. You can achieve results that look like that, right? So hope that helps, uh, Jacob. I mean, we, uh, we do have a, um, like it, what I just said, broken down in like an infographic on the golf course lawn store. I can show you really quick there. So if you go here, if you go golfcourselawn.store and you, which is right there on the screen, and you just go to shop and just click on shop. You will see, when you scroll past all the different collections, you'll see this infographic that pretty much sums up how to get a great lawn in five easy steps. Step one, eliminate weeds. Step two, do a soil test. Three, fertilize your lawn based on the soil test results. Step four, mow, mow, and mow some more. And then step five, dominate, right? And between that and all the blogs that we publish weekly that have tons of great content on different lawn care topics, how to get a, how to get stripes, how to nail weed, weed management this summer, best fertilizers to use in your lawn, like all that stuff. Between all that and then actually doing the thing, because it's one thing just to you know watch the live streams and watch YouTube videos and email and this kind of thing, but by actually doing the work, getting out there and, and, and doing it and making mistakes and learning from them and, and getting better, you're going to get a great lawn. It's, it's kind of hard to not get good at something if you spend a lot of time at it and you're always looking to improve it. So hope that helps. Glad that you're new and you're, welcome, and you're on the, in the live stream. And again, normally we do them on Friday nights, but today we just did a, uh, you know, a bonus one this morning because I got rained out and I was like, you know what? I, I, I woke up this morning. I really wanted to live stream. I really want to get something done. And now I'm not going to be able to do it outside. So here we go. All right, so on Instagram, we got um, Moro in the house, Zavi saying hi. What's going on, Moro? Hopefully you're doing well, sir. Hope all's going on, going well with you. I saw you guys had a birthday party there the other day. Looks like you guys had a, had a lot of fun from the pictures that I saw. All right, next up, we have um, M2 Flower. And guys, if you have questions, I mean, feel free. I mean, there's, um, I, I've got a couple of talking points um, mainly around around um, what product combinations make sense to mix together and spray together because I've because I'm, I've gotten some questions like over this weekend over that so I figured hey we want to talk about that today um, but if you have any other questions things issues you're dealing with your lawn sometimes I have the answer sometimes I don't but I'll do my best to help you out all right M U two flyer is up next saying I'm on the west coast I have tall fescue grass and I want to level my lawn sounds like fun I have about a hundred a hundred thousand square feet. I have 100,000 square feet, so a little over two acres. That's a lot. I uh, would like to start leveling about 10,000 square feet. All right, cool. Yeah, so I mean, so as far as, uh, I like what you're doing. I mean, you're not trying to do two acres at once. I mean, it would be, you know, very expensive to do that. I mean, to, to, to do that much property all in one go. Um, 10,000 square feet, what I'll tell you is as a general rule, you didn't ask any questions, but as far as if I were gonna go out and, and level 10,000 square feet or top 10,000 square feet of, of lawn, the general rule, at least for the first time you do it, is you want one yard, one cubic yard of material per thousand square feet. So if you have 10,000 square foot lawn, you're gonna want around 10 yards of material and that's gonna, you know, again, every lawn is different, but that that is a is a good um, amount that's going to allow you to put down between a quarter and half an inch of material. Um, so, which, which is which is good because you're not gonna want to go too um, too heavy, especially your first time around. You also got a fescue lawn, so I imagine you're not mowing it that short. But ten yards, ten yards of material is um is would be a good way to go. As far as the process that I like to use whenever I do top dressing um, M2 MU2 flyer is I like to do aeration first. I like to do aeration and then do um, you know fertilizer or any kind of granular products, biostimulants is like, I use a product called Essential G. So I like to do that as part of, of, um, of the in-between step from aeration and top dressing, and then finally top dressing. So to recap, again, aerate your lawn, that's gonna help whatever soil or, or blend or sand blend you're putting down to better integrate into your existing soil profile. So aerating is really important. Next up, 
fertilize or apply biostimulants or do both. And then finally, your uh, your top dressing. You know what I mean? Uh, the only other thing you're gonna want to um, invest in, assuming you don't have heavy equipment, I mean, you you want to invest on a good leveling rake. Even if you have a drag, like if you built like um like a grate that you can drag behind like a four wheeler, it's still beneficial to have a a standalone leveling rake for little areas to do some touch up work and to to really work the material in. So um so yeah, that's um that's a you know as far as like in a, in a quick uh, quick chat as far as how to you know how to top your lawn I've got um, a blog post on that topic here on the on our store on the golf course lawn store so if you go to so say you just go to golf course store and then you go to guides and which should take you to our blog you will find on the first page this um, this one from last actually it was April wow time flies from late April on how to top your lawn a complete guide in there it talks about the basics of top dressing some of the stuff I already talked about the type of um, mixtures that you you want you can use um, how to top dress your lawn, uh, the tools you're going to want to need to use. Um, you know, if you're going to re reduce, in your case, this isn't going to apply, but if you're going to reduce the, help, the your height of cut by doing a light scalp to help make the job a bit easier, how to do that, um, how to do the aeration aspect of your lawn, um, the fertilizers that I like to use as part of top dressing, and just, you know, the steps, the various steps involved in that process. So if you're interested, I will send this to you. I'll link it to you here in the chat so you'll have something to reference. Again, not all of it is going to apply to you given that you have um, a fescue lawn and that you tend to move a little bit taller. Like I wouldn't want to tell you to cut your fescue lawn down to an inch, right? Um, but if you have, um, so just that portion of it, you're going to you're gonna want to, um, you'll want to discard. But yeah, but in general, the that guidance and other guidance on the store, I think you'll find helpful as far as getting a good result with top dressing. I've also got some good YouTube some YouTube videos on that as well, also linked in there. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, sounds like a good, a, a fun project. You know, your first time biting off 10,000 square feet is, um, you know, that's, I think that's a good, that's a, that's a good starting point. Make sure you have some help. It really does make the process easier. If you can use heavy equipment, I think having three people um, really makes top dressing go quickly because you can have one person that's loading up like a top dressing machine, assuming you're using that. You can have um, another person that's taking the spreading equipment that you have. Like I've used the earth and earth turf spreader um, before. So have the person like, that's actually going out and moving and dropping the material on the lawn. And then you have another person that that is like dragging it in or, or, or working into the surface. So you have, if you have three people, it's like a, it's like a well-oiled machine. You can get a lot done. Obviously you're going to want to switch out jobs, switch out roles because the person that's doing, that's actually working the material in is kind of getting the short end of the stick. But having three people really makes it go quickly. Like you could do 10,000 square feet in a, in a few hours in a morning if you have a bunch of people, whereas if you're doing it yourself, it's more like a weekend. You know what I mean? So I would, I would say that's the only piece of advice I'd give you is get, make sure you have some help whenever you are, um, are taking that on. All right, next up, we have a super chat from Mr. Doug, 350Z with the twin turbo package. Thank you so much, Doug. Super chat received. He says, King Ron, my neighbor asked me what gets rid of chiggers, um, Miramichi green pest control. I don't, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I don't think, I'm pretty sure that's not on the label. Let me see. I'm, I got in the bottle right here, but I'm pretty sure that's not, um, that's not on there. Mosquitoes, ants, noceums, roaches, ticks, aphids, white flies, fleas, and chinch bugs. Now, there are other... There are other um, um, insects that this targets that are not on the label, like the ones that are that are related, that are in the, that, those families. But these are the ones they've actually done testing on and say that, you know, at the, at the rates that we recommend, um, you can get good control. So I'll, I'll, I'll just look into that one, Doug. I don't know if I have your email. If I don't, drop me an email here and I can, I'll find out for you and, and email you after the show. So right here, ron at golfcourselon.com. Um, I'll look into that and I'll get, I'll get an answer. I'll get an answer uh, for you on that one. Appreciate the super chat. Uh, I don't have um, doing that one off the top of my head, but, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll look into it and I will get you an answer. And look at that, man. You are, we don't have um, any of these other, our normal folks here in the live stream as yet. So you are the show sponsor. How about that? Your name in lights for whatever that means to you. Make sure I spell it right. Doug 350Z with the twin turbo package. All right, there you go. Uh, boom. Yes. All right. That worked. Cool. All right. So as far, good morning, um, um, Hurricane Aaron. Uh, appreciate you coming to hang out in the live stream for a little bit. All right. So back to where we were, where we left off. Again, thanks for the super chat, um, um, M2 Flyer. All right. Um, Tony Turner says, I'm about to get, um, get out the Rue, the Rue, I'm about to get the Rue out this morning. I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, you get your mower out this morning, um, a rut out of, oh, the true cut, okay. Get, get the true cut out this morning. Sounds good, Tony. Someone needs to mow because I really wanted to mow today. And you see, look, this is what happened to me. I was like, you know what? The guys, you know, the the, the, the crowd, they want to see, you know, we get out there and do some live streaming and mowing the lawn. I said, it's going to mow for like maybe early morning, but it'll be fine. I'll be able to get all the equipment out there and have a grand old time. And the more I looked, the more I realized that this is going to be my day. So when Mother Nature, when Mother Nature gives you uh, rain, you just come inside and live stream anyway, right? So hopefully you're, get, um, you're getting to mow, uh, Tony. Someone needs to, because I'm not going to get to mow today. All right, next up is uh, Dustin. <laughs> That's a good one. He says, how do I get my wife to cut the lawn? I mean, I, I don't know. She kind of has to like doing it, right? If she, if she doesn't like mowing, it doesn't like working in the lawn, you kind of, you don't, you don't make someone that doesn't like doing something do it. Um, and especially if you want it to come out nice, you don't make them do it, right? You, you can always tell when don't, someone does anything and if they're, if they're into it uh, based on how they go about it. So, I mean, you know, if she says, how do I get my wife to cut the lawn? I don't, I don't know. I mean, if she's not into into lawn care, you're probably not going to be able to. Like, if she wanted to get you to do something that you don't like doing, like, suppose she likes, um, I don't know. Suppose she likes baking, right? Suppose she likes baking. She just says, how do I get you to bake? And you don't like baking. Like, how would she get you to do that? I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, if, she's, if she's not into it, I would encourage you to not try and force her to do it because, one... Probably not going to, and then second, the lawn's like I get is not going to look as nice. She's not going to cut it as nice. She's not going to. If you're not, if you're, if you don't care about something, it is. It's going to be very obvious. I think everyone knows either people you work with or, um, or just when you watch someone do something, you can tell when someone has passion for something, like working in their lawn, and when someone just really doesn't do it, doesn't doesn't care, and they're just doing it just to get it done. It's it, the appearance and what and how it, how the end result looks is completely different. So I wouldn't try and force her to do it, or even if she even if you could. Which you probably can't. All right, so Jacob Acton is up next with, with a super chat. Thank you so much, Jacob. He says, it is a Shiba dog with a big smile on his face, tilting his head. Shiba eating you? You know, you're into that coin? You're in that coin life, man? All right, next up we got uh, Jason Harrison here. He says, at, um, isn't that Charlotte? I think CLT is Charlotte. He says, at CLT Airport, what a better way to wait for a flight? I don't know, there's other things you could be doing. You know, I like, could be watching, I guess, watching the news. You could be, um, I don't know, I guess in an airport, this this is more fun if you're into lawn care. But, you know. But yeah, Jason, Jason hopefully you're going somewhere fun. Uh, if, you know, travel safe. Travel safe. Hopefully the weather is better where you are than it is here in the great state of Georgia. All right, next up we got Ryan Needham saying, came down heavy in Missouri last night, sunny now. Yeah, not here. Not here. I mean, it's, hopefully it, it, it breaks and I can get to at least mow later on this afternoon slash this evening. But I don't know, man. It's, it's, it's the forecast in northeast Georgia. It looks like it's going to be rain all day long. The one thing that's nice is the rain is it's not a deluge, right? Like if you notice, there's no there's no lake in the back lawn, right? There's no lake. It's just it's a nice, steady rain, um, which is which is good. It's just awesome if you got if you top dressed yesterday, which, you know, some of the people in my neighborhood did. So for them, it's perfect. But for me, that wants to rain, wants to rain, wants to mow. Not so much, not so much. That I, you know, what can you do? At least I could be happy for them that they're getting their uh, their 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 top dressing watered in. All right. Next up, we have um, Carlos J says, "Good morning, all from Puerto Rico." Um, what's up? What's going on, Carlos? Thanks for coming to hang out. Um, thanks. I, I've I've got some friends um, in Puerto Rico. I used to I used to go that when I was in, when I used to live back when I used to when I was back home. I used to live um, in the Caribbean. That's where I grew up. Um, you know, a trip to Puerto Rico pretty much every year that that happened. So to, um, where do we used to go? So uh, Guayanabo, that area, that's where we would um, fly to San Juan and then go to, to Guayanabo, like that area. All right, next up is Umberto Lopez. He says, this rain is not helping me get rid of my nuts edge. The stuff is thriving with all the rain. That's the thing. That's the thing that you, that is a, a true words have never been spoken, um, Umberto. Nuts edge loves, um, loves water, loves like wet portion, what areas of your lawn. In my lawn, I get it in the swale area, so that area that where the back lawn drains that runs between my lawn and Alex's lawn, and also um, in, uh, on the back side that you guys really ever see the the that little crest where the water runs off there a lot too. Also, nuts edge um, grows, so that's that tends to be a thing. Sedges tend to like wet areas of your lawn, so. I'm not surprised you're dealing with it. Something you can do, you can use for that, is um, a a herbicide called Certainty. This is what I like on my lawn. I've already sprayed, 
I've already sprayed once this year and it did a great job knocking it back. I haven't had any in the uh, in the swale areas yet, but on the, the crust area, like the, the back part, um, this, uh, this, this did the business, knocked it out. And the nice thing about this is that even though it's not an inexpensive um, herbicide, it, when you're targeting sedges, it doesn't take a whole lot of this to get a good result. So you can mix two to three of the small, sorry, three to, no, three to four of the small scoops with, um, with two gallons of water and that's that's awesome for spot spraying sedges. If you wanna really get a really good result, mix some surfactant with it. So these two, Certainty and, um, get my eyes out of this, Certainty and surfactant, like this uh, this combination uh, is great. Devastating against sedges. The only negative is that it's only for warm season grass. So, so those of you, you guys that have cool season lawns, um, you are gonna be um, relegated to using sedge hammer, which is still a good product. It's just not as good as Certainty, in my opinion. So if you got warm season lawn, go with the best, which in my opinion, again, is um, is Certainty. It's really good for, for sedges. So once it dries up, Umberto, you know, just get out there and um, and knock them back. You know, get out there and, and spray them. It is uh, it's better to 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 get to get them. You know, don't don't let them get out of hand and start propagating and and um, and and making a you know where a portion of your lawn becomes dominated by sedges. I, I would knock them out a bit a bit earlier than uh, than later. So, sorry you're dealing with that, but sedges are actually pretty easy to, um, again, to control with um, with something like Certainty. Next up, we got Mr. Joseph Roberts in the house saying, good morning, Ron, and morning, everyone. Morning, uh, um, Joseph. Hey guys, also, if any of you guys were on the store yesterday, there was um, there was some kind of update that was done that, that I think that Shopify did that, that broke um, the ability to go through, like, like, like if you had like um, products that have multiple um, variants, like for some reason you, you wouldn't be able to select um, the different variants. So, for, no, so what that basically call, caused is if you went to like, um, let's see, I'm pretty sure this is fixed. I think we went over and I was, I was testing a lot of it um, yesterday and this morning. Um, so it should be better now. But yeah, if you went, I'll show you, if you went to like the golf course lawn store, let's see if we could do this now, do it live. So, and you went to the, say, fertilizer, right? For any of these that are just a single product, it was fine. But if you went to like, say, Nutri-Kelp, right? Um, and if you tried to pick like one gallon or 32 ounce bottle, this would not work. So it only showed just this, just the one large one, the, the, the two and a half gallon, and you couldn't switch to any of the smaller ones. If, in, if that was a problem you guys had, you were having yesterday, I got a, an email about it, and that's when I started investigating and figured out what was going on and fixed it. Um, if you guys are, are were trying to order like smaller amounts of like, you know, the um, some of the granular fertilizers, some of the, like the yard mastery fertilizers that we carry, um, any of the liquid products, that's been si since fixed. So you can go to the store now and everything should be working. If it doesn't, send me an email. Um, but I, I found, um, found the problem and we were able to address it. Something else I want to tell you guys as well. All right, next up, we got Mr. Jermaine Battles in the house. He says, hey, Ron, what's going on, Jermaine? Hopefully you are doing well, hopefully all is going well with uh, with you. And then Doug says, "Send that, send that rain, send that rain." Man, you can have some of it. I mean, I'm I'm trying to not be selfish, uh, Doug. You know, what I mean, I, I realize that I don't want it to rain because I want to get out there and mow, and really I wanted to live stream mowing. Um, but I realize there's other people that were out there doing doing some hard work yesterday. You know, getting their lawns right, doing their top dressing, and rain is a good thing. So I need to not be selfish and be like, you know what? Let them um, have theirs. Let them get theirs as well too. Forgot to turn the light on in the background, so. All right, so next up we got Sean Murphy. He is here, he says, I'm on the Friday uh, night streams. I just never comment. Always soaking up the vast amount of information. Keep up with the great work. I appreciate that, Sean. Thank you so much, man. It really does, it really does mean, um, really does mean a lot. You know, on the topic of a talking point, right? So a question that I've that I've gotten like twice since Friday night, and I've been getting throughout the season, and I've I've, I've addressed it here and there throughout the live streams. I may as well just talk about it now. When it comes to mixing products, right? Like what kind of what kind of products can you mix together, and which ones um, would I not mix, right? So, you know, a, co a common question I get is, hey, if I'm spraying um, herbicide, let's say I'm spraying the Celsius Certainty Kit. And I'm spraying Primo, and I'm spraying surfactant, and I'm doing, or um, I'm mixing surfactant with it. Can I do all those things? Um, 
And the, the, gen the general rule I would, I would say is this, if you're spraying liquid fertilizer, if you're spraying liquid fertilizer or you're spraying Primo, I would not add surfactant. So if, you, if it's one of these things where you're just really pressed for time, you wanna go out and you wanna you know, blanket spray an entire lawn, I guess for, for weeds, and you also just wanna also spray your growth regulator and liquid fertilizer at the same time, you can do that. Cause again, they're all foliar based products, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily add surfactant um, to that. Um, the best way to do it, the best way to do that would be to do two separate sprays. So do one where you are mixing the two herbicides, Celsius Certainty, Surfactant, and Marker Dye, right? And spraying along with that. And then later on that, that day or even the next day, go out and do your, your foliar spray for like your your um, your growth regulator, liquid um, FERT. Um, if you're spraying like the carbon kit or any other, other bio, liquid biostimulants, um, doing that separately. Right, but, but can you can you spray herbicides and fertilizer at the same time? Yes. The only thing that I would recommend not doing um, is, especially if you're using Primo as well, is not adding surfactant along with it. I wouldn't I wouldn't do that um, because you, what you might find is you might get a bit of, a bit more yellowing um, that otherwise would not be there if you didn't add surfactant to it. So, um, the next question I um, I got again twice this weekend was around uh, around fungicide um, uh, fungicide applications. So as a general rule, if you're going to, if you're spraying um, products that are soil based, so fungus, some fungicide, insecticide, pre-emergent, um, those all benefit from a larger droplet size when it comes to, um, when it comes to, to applying them. They also benefit from, from um, more carrier, having more water. So whereas you guys hear me always talk about saying that, you know, you can, as a general rule, you want, um, you want to, uh, you want to have one gallon of whatever you're spraying, cover a thousand square feet. Um, that's a that's a good general rule for foliar sprays because it allows you to get good, I mean, typically a gallon over a thousand square feet when you're doing a foliar spray is enough. That's enough carrier to get, to get good coverage. If you're spraying, say, fungicide or insecticide and you don't intend to water them in, you can take whatever the rate happens to be. So take, for example, um, a fungicide like Pillar, right? So take like this, right? The, a fungicide like Pillar SC. The active the, the the application rate for this is one ounce of the product over a thousand square feet. Now, if you wanted to mix that one ounce with a gallon of water, that's on the lighter side. But if you're going to run irrigation right after, that can work. If you want to mix it with two gallons of water, that will work. If you want to mix it with four gallons of water, that will work, right? So, but the, the 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 key thing to keep in mind is is the when you're looking at product labels, they're not going to it's going to say you know, X amount or X percentage or X ounces or whatever it is of the product um, over a certain area, over a square foot, over a certain amount of square footage. How much carrier, how much water you mix with that in many ways is, is up to you. Now, I really wouldn't recommend going less than one gallon per thousand square feet because it's, it's pretty tough to get good coverage if you do that. But something like um, Pillar, like if, if memory serves me, if you read the label for this, like they will say... Um, They'll say two. They'll say two gallons. Two gallons with an ounce over a thousand square feet. Right. So the thing to keep in mind whenever you are, you are um, spraying products, especially soil-based ones that 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 benefit from more water, is that you want to pay attention to the amount of active ingredient, the amount of the product that the label says covers a thousand square feet, and then you can adjust the amount of water you use accordingly. So again, for Pillar, on the label, it'll say two gallons per thousand, or it'll even say four gallons per thousand. But the big thing that, the thing that doesn't change is one ounce of this product. So whether you're mixing with two gallons of water, four gallons of water, um, that's that's com that's completely up to you. So um, now as far as what I would stack together, so say you're going out, you're gonna be spraying insecticide, fungicide, um, you really won't be spraying pre-emergent this time of year, but let's say you are, right? Whatever, let's say that you you're, decide you wanna spray pre-emergent too. Um, that, those three would be things that you could combine. So if you want to mix like an insecticide, like, like, a, like a celeprin, I think I've got it here. So if you want to mix like an insecticide, like a celeprin and a fungicide like pillar, both of these are soil based. They both need to be watered in. They both benefit from a larger droplet size. They, neither of them require surfactant. Um, so as far as products that it makes sense to mix together and spray at once, this this combination makes sense. It wouldn't make sense. Now, can you do it? Yes, but is it the best idea? No. Could you mix pillar with like your foliar sprays for like um, like, like Primo and, and liquid fertilizer and biosimilants 
And would it technically work? Yes, but it's not ideal. It's not, it's not, I, I wouldn't recommend that. I would really say if you're going to, if, if you're going to be mixing products to try and save time, um, try and um, uh, do so where you are, are um, you are, you are, you're, you're applying products that are designed to get into either the either a foliar spray or or a soil based product. So that way you're 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 using one the correct spray tip. You're not adding surfactant where you don't need it. Um, and in and in general, I think you're just going to get a better result. The only reason to to violate that rule is just a time savings. And most of you guys that are watching this, I mean, you're doing this because you're into your lawn. You're into you enjoy it as a hobby. Um, and most of you. I won't say you're not pressed for time because everybody's busy, but you obviously make time for this because you enjoy doing it, right? Um, so if that's you, I would um, I would say that if you're going to spray fungicide and insecticide like that, you can mix together and spray together, no problem. Um, and these two, by the way, I've, I've you, these two you do mix nicely as far as mixing them and spraying them. There's no issues. There's no weird interactions. I've already tested that. That works fine. Um, but then also when it comes to like your do, your foliar sprays, so like you know stuff that we're trying to spray on the skin of the plant, on the leaf of the plant, like Primo, liquid fertilizer, liquid biostimulants, like that stuff makes sense to mix together. So hope that helps. It's a question I've gotten, and um, I, I'm just you know, trying to, I might take this little segment here and cut it out and, and, uh, and post it separately on, on YouTube because it's a, it's a, it's a common question I've been getting here lately. Um, and again, what, what I just, what I've described is not a hard, fast rule, but hopefully what I, the way I explained it makes sense, right? Soil-based products, mix those together they, and apply them and then follow your, do the, the, you can do a separate app for those. So that's, um, that's one of the talking points that I wanted to, to cover. Um, based on 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 questions I've been receiving here lately. If you guys are enjoying the live stream, again, I know it's kind of impromptu, by all means, hit that like button ever so gently. It costs you guys absolutely nothing. Think about it. I mean, it's a way to help brighten my day too. You know what I mean? I really want to get out and mow today. I'm not going to get to mow. If you guys wouldn't mind hitting that like button, I really would appreciate it. All right, so we have a question here on Instagram. Oh, this is a tough one. It's, it's a question that many people are... Um, you know, that people are very passionate about. I'm passionate about it. And it's on the question of real mowers. It says, morning, Ron. Do you have a recommendation for real mowers? I currently use the Earthwise. Okay, so you're using a push one. Okay, cool. However, I would love to get a powered real mower. All right, so it's a great question, uh, Jason. What I would tell you is this. The, um, any real mower, any real mower that is set up properly will produce a great cut, right? Now, there are some that cut better than others, um, but they, they, for the, for all intents and purposes, they can, they all produce very good qualities of cut. Um, the, the thing that I look at or, or pay attention to when it comes to choosing one is before you buy a real mower in your area, see who can service it. So if, as far as getting, um, like getting parts or getting services or getting service from the standpoint of getting it ground, or if you have, have to get maintenance work done on it, like if you could find someone in your area that works on whatever mower you're trying to, you're considering, um, that's, that's a very important consideration that I think most people don't give enough um, enough credit to because if you don't do that, then you're stuck with having to like mail or you know mail like cartridges out or you know or, or drive hours to get the the mower worked on, which just makes it a lot less convenient, a lot less fun. Now, so let's say you live in Georgia, you're in Northeast Georgia, Atlanta area, which pretty much means you can use any real mower you want because it's pretty much someone that can work on any of them, right? So let's say that's you. When it comes to powered real mowers, they come, they are. They really come into to two different tiers, in my opinion, right? So you have a like the True Cuts, the California Trimmers, the McLeans, which are great mowers. They can get, get a great cut with any of them, um, and um, you know those are going to run you if you're going to buy one brand new, you know, between two to three thousand dollars. I mean, price on all this stuff has gone up, but around around three grand if you're buying one brand new. If you're buying one pre-owned, buy one pre-owned, you can pick one up for anywhere between six fifty to. $1,300 in that, in that price range. Um, that's, you can get, get a pretty good mower for that price and they're going to cut well, they are going to produce a good cut and they are going to, you know, you're going to like the way your lawn looks going from a, from a push reel mower to a powered, like a true cut trimmer or McLean, you're going to like the little way your lawn looks going to be, it's going to be a noticeable step up. Now, the next tier up from that, from your McLean's, your true cuts, your trimmers, are your greens mower, greens mowers, or your mowers that, um, a better way of saying it, are your mowers that, that are propelled with a rear drum. Um, reason being is that the, the true cut, even though I, I have a true cut, absolutely love it. The, the, the issue with um, the McLean trimmers and true cuts is the way they're propelled is that you end up with um, like, like 
um, hot spots in your stripes in the lawn, right? Like you, if you look at a, a lawn that's been cut with a true cut, you can you're gonna see the middle stripe, and then on the outside of the path of the mower's taking, like where the two drive wheels are, the the stripes are going to be like the the grass is gonna be noticeably lower there, and the stripes are also gonna look different there. And and stripes aside, over time you can get ruts in the lawn um, from that because the the entire weight of the mower is really being concentrated in a smaller space versus like a greens mower, like a um, a Toro Greens Master, the John Deere's, uh, like the Allet's, although an Allet technically isn't a greens mower, but like an Allet um, or, um, you know, like the, like the Sterlings, even like the, uh, take like, a, what's another, the other one, like the Swordman, like it's also that are done, that are propelled by rear drums. What you will find with those is the stripes tend to be better because you have this, you know, two, 300 pound piece of equipment and that weight of the bower, instead of it being concentrated into a couple of drive wheels, it's spread out over the entire rear drum. So the net result is whenever you, you cut, um, you're not going to have, you, the stripes are going to be much more uniform. Um, and and uh, they're gonna last longer, and the quality of cut I find is better with those mowers than they are with um, with like a, a true cut or um, or a trimmer or a McLean. Like, and I have I have a true cut, and I've got a um, a greens mower, and literally I'll tell you for you know not to not to be a dead horse on this, but literally when I when I had my true cut, I thought you know true cut is the best thing, best mower known to man. It will never get better than this. I don't care what these people with greens mowers say. It can't get better than this, right? And literally, if you um, when I got my Greens Master, when I got my 1600, so in that video on the, where I did a review of the 1600, you actually, you'll see, I actually did a, by, a side by side. And when I, I first made um, my first passes with a Greens mower, and I stopped, shut the mower off and looked at the stripes, I actually, I just started laughing. I looked at, I looked at the difference between what, what I thought was a, a, an excellent cut, and then like a world-class cut, you know what I mean? So it's, if, if all you care about, and again, assuming that you can you can get any of these mowers, um, like say budget doesn't really matter and you can get any of them, um, if quality of cut is all you care about, like you want the best stripes, you want the best quality of cut, you're gonna wanna get a true, you're gonna, sorry, you're gonna wanna get a Greens, um, a Greens Master or a John Deere or um, or an Allet. The, that's, in, again, this is my opinion. Um, uh, those 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 three, you're gonna have a really hard time beating. There are other greens mowers out there. I don't have any um, like this Jacobson. I think makes a, green, a good greens mower, but I've never I've never used those, and they're also not that popular. But uh, a a greens master, a um, John Deere, or an Allet, as far as quality of cut, it's gonna be really really hard to beat to beat that. Um, if you look at Robert's lawn, who won the our stripe competition, I know you're not on YouTube, but the but he uses a John Deere. And it's, um, uh, for those of you guys that are on YouTube, I will find it, I'll find his lawn, this one. So that is cut with a John Deere, right? And that's, uh, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with that lawn. I mean, that is, that is you know, that's, that's flawless. It's, it's a, that's a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous lawn. It's, it looks so good, it looks fake. It looks like 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 stock photography, like it was like the video, like the picture was edited. But I can I can assu I can assure you it's not because he sends me tons of pictures all the time. He sends me pictures of him standing on it, and the lawn just looks the turf is incredible. It's an awesome, awesome, awesome turf. So, so hope that helps. Um, what, what am I not covered? Um, pricing. Yes. So, like wild greens mowers and Allets do produce a better cut. There's no free lunch. So the the thing is when you look at like a, a John Deere or a Toro or an Allet like a brand new Sterling, like what I have over, over, um, over me right now, those are like, they're pushing like six grand. They're like well into $5,000 for one of these things before you buy all the cartridges. If you buy a um, a Greens Master or a John Deere, you're in a, into five figures. So last year I actually got a quote on a new, it's not even the 1600 anymore, but the new um, 26 inch um, Greens mower and it was like $16,000. So. I say all that to say that I don't expect you to go buy a brand new one, but when you do buy one, because you can find a pre-owned John Deere or a pre-owned Greens Master for you know two grand, three grand. I mean, you can find like a nice one for that price range. You can find them cheaper, but if you want one that's in really good shape, around two to two thousand dollars, two five hundred dollars, pushing three grand is what you should expect to pay. Why it's important to know what these mowers cost brand new is whenever they break, which isn't very often, but whenever they break or, you know, you have to buy parts or so you have to go and replace like a reel or a bed knife, the price of those parts is going to be higher than what you're going to be paying for a true cut or a trimmer or a, um, or a McLean. So it's almost like people that go out and they buy like used Porsches, right? Yeah. You bought a used Porsche and you maybe paid 30, 40 grand for a car that was once 
$120,000, $130,000, but the price of those parts are for a car that costs that much. Same thing with the with greens mowers. The, the cost of parts um, is more expensive. The cost of maintenance is more expensive. So in many ways, it just it, it really is you get what you pay for. So you have to decide you know, what's important to you. Um, if uncompromised, if, if cut quality, like you're, you're not going to compromise on that, get a greens, get a greens mower. And honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to scare you a little bit on the, on the price of the parts, but really those mowers are built like tanks. I mean, they are, they just, they're designed to run, you know, hours and hours every single day because they're designed for golf courses. They're designed for professional turf. We take them and bring them on our lawns. And we run them like, you know, an hour, you know, an hour, two to three times a week, and we're not we're not doing anything to them. You know what I mean? So they are they are commercial pieces of equipment. So it's not like they break down very often. But when they do require maintenance, the parts are more expensive. So hope that helps. Um, you know, got yeah, plenty of info now as far as what to do if if you should you decide to upgrade your Earthwise. And I uh, hope that is helpful. All right, so we got a question here from Wolf Tim. He says, "Hi Ron, with Primo Max, if a section of my yard is one thousand three hundred fifty six square feet." very precise. You saw that. You didn't say 1,300, like 1,356 square feet. Um, how should I measure it in Primo? Is it okay to mow and apply right away? Any wait time? Uh, so, you know, so you have, you got a, a thousand square foot lawn. Um, I, I guess you're, you're saying, how would I, how would I measure that? So if, um, you can tell me what your grass type is, but let's say, let's say for Bermuda, right, you were going to spray, um, for a hybrid, the rate for Primo is, um, is on the high end is 0.38 or almost 0 0.40, right? So between 0.25 and point um, and 0 0.40 thereabouts. So if you're going to spray 1,500 square feet, which is about what you got, right? You could mix up. Um, you could mix up. Let me think about to do the math on this real quick. You could mix up like 0 0.55, 0 0.6 thereabouts um, in two gallons of water. And spray that over your thirteen hundred. You could go. You could, if you want. You could. I mean, that's and that's for the full rate. If you're only going to spray once per month, if you're going to spray it, um, if you're going to spray, uh, divide that up and spray it every every couple of weeks. You could take that down to 0.25. You could spray like a quarter of an ounce of Primo um, with a couple of gallons of water over that over that thirteen hundred over over that. We'll round it up to fifteen hundred square feet. That would work out well. Now, as far as um, to mow and apply right away, I typically do a day after. So if I mowed today, I'll spray Primo the following day. I don't, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with necessarily doing it, but I don't, I don't necessarily mow um, in the morning or mow, the, mow that day and then the same day go out and apply Primo. Normally it's, I mow the day, I mow the, the day before, I apply my growth regulator and then I mow again, you know, two, three days later. So that's, that's how I, um, how I tend to do it. So hope that helps. Um, and again, as far as, you know, I'll send you a link to this as well. As far as some tips on applying growth regulator, we have a blog on the store on that topic. So if you go to this golf course lawn store and blog, there is a, um, article. Did it get pushed to page two? I think it did on page two now on how plant growth regulation can make your lawn thicker and greener. I will, um, I'll copy this and I'll send it to you. So, uh, so yeah, so there you go. Take a look at this, Wilf, Tim. Uh, this should also be helpful as well. So good, great question. If you need anything else, uh, let me know. Have fun with growth regulator. When, when, if it's your first time spraying Primo, I will tell you that when you, when you put it in the tank, it's not going to look like very much. Like it doesn't take, like I've got it right here. So for you starting out, if we're going to be super conservative, you can take a quarter of an ounce. So points so between 0.2 and 0.3, you know what I mean? Like somewhere in that in that amount and spray that, um, mix that with a couple of gallons of water, with two gallons of water and spray that over your um, your 1,500 square feet or so. That will, um, that should be fine. You can do that twice a month. And that blog I just linked explains the whole, um, the 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 split app, the split app um, um, technique that I like to use, like spraying it um, on the first and on the 15th. So hope that helps. All right, so let me see what else I've missed. I don't want to see if there's any more uh, questions, super chats. I think there's another super chat that came in from Jacob. Let me run down here really quick and grab that. There we are. Thanks for that, Jacob. Super chat received. He says, I have a year and a half old Bermuda lawn that's on crappy, rocky, new construction uh, uh, soil. Uh, sprinkler system is going in soon. Soil amendment Rex. Thanks in advance, Ron. Mm. So as far as 
Um, if you're talking about soil amendments from a standpoint of like nutrients, like uh, your what, what fertilizer you should be applying, um, the way to figure that out is going to be with a soil test. I mean, I can't, I mean, I don't know what's what's going on with your soil to be able to say this fertilizer is going to be, you know, the best fit. I mean, if you don't want to do a soil test, which again, I, I highly recommend that you do one because these are like 30 bucks. It's like, like it's literally some of the, the it's like the, the best $30 you'll spend on your lawn. Even if you only do it once and never do it again, it's like literally the best $30 you'll spend because it'll tell you exactly um, one, what which fertilizer is going to be the best fit, but also like what your soil pH is at. So that, that um, in a major way affects how well your fertilizer works, how well your grass grows. Um, so uh, getting a soil test done is a big important part of that. Outside of fertilizer, if you want to use um, um, uh, a biostimulant, like a granular biostimulant, I'm a big fan of doing that. So I can show you really quick, Jacob, if you're going to be doing... Um, so you guys sprinkler system going in soon. So the lawn's going to get, it's going to get beat up. It's going to get torn up anyway. Um, what you can use is if you go to the golf course lawn store, go to shop and then go to Miramichi green biostimulants. There's a biostimulant called uh, essential G. Um, it, this I apply on my lawn every single month. Uh, this is a great, a great product, great, great, um, addition to your lawn care program. And you'd have to get a soil test to be able to use it. Right. Um, so it's a combination of compost, biochar, humate, Reclaim coffee grounds, a little bit of silicon in there. It's a great product. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. Again, I apply it on my lawn every single month. Um, and the benefits of what it does is, uh, is on multiple fronts. One, you're adding, you're increasing the amount of organic material in your soil, which is a good thing. And then you're also adding biochar, which helps any fertilizer that you apply, especially particularly granular fertilizer, to work better. So you're able to apply less fertilizer and have it work for longer in your lawn. It, it prevents um, the fertilizer from leaching out of the soil, which means it it it, it runs it um it, it passes through the soil profile um, to where it gets gets deep enough to where you can't you can't your your grass can't take advantage of it anymore. You think about it, like most fertilizer that gets applied or most granular, a lot of it is lost. I don't say most, but a lot of it is lost. Um, so as you apply it, as that nutrient works down through the soil, through the soil profile, it gets deeper and deeper. And once you get past, you know, 12 inches or so, your even though it's in technically in your in your lawn, in the soil, your grass really can't take advantage of it. Biochar holds on to some of that and allows it and makes it available for your for your plants for the plant. So it's it's a good thing to do in your lawn as far as how often to apply it. I do it monthly. Um, and really, based based on how, on your budget is um, is how often and, and how and how much I would say to apply. But monthly, once a month is a um, is a good is a good recommendation. So yeah, so essential G. Um, and then once you get your soil test results, you can come over to the part of the store that everyone seems to like the most, which is the fertilizer section. Go to shop and then lawn fertilizer. We've got three major options here that I'm a huge fan of. So you've got Humic Max, which is the fertilizer that um, by far is the one that that, that people um, we probably saw the most of because it's a good it's a good balanced fertilizer um, for lawns that do not need phosphorus. And you're like, well, how do I know I need phosphorus? Your soil test results are going to tell you. Hence, why you need a soil test. And then if you do need phosphorus, the complete 14714 is an excellent choice. And then for um, for lawns that are that are more stressed this time of year, so take like uh, cool season lawns or a warm season turf in the spring or in the um, late fall when they're going out of dorm going into dormancy or when they're coming out of dormancy, the stress well 12024 is a great option. All of these products are not just fertilizers, which is why I'm a huge fan of them. Um, they all contain humic acid. They all, um, um, the the complete and the stress, these two also contain kelp. They also contain some micronutrient like iron, some manganese as well. So it's a, as far as um, a way to feed your soil, they're a, com they're a, com they're a complete um, um, program. It's not just a straight fertilizer. You're getting, you're getting micronutrients um, as well and, bi and biostimulants as well whenever you're applying any of these three. So, um, so yeah, so hope that helps, um, Jacob. It's not uncommon, unfortunately, that when you have new construction for there to be, um, rocks and other garbage in it, it's, uh, you know, I actually did a video on that of, uh, should I say this right? So Alex's brother-in-law's friend, Alex's brother-in-law's friend, um, had a, um, you know, he had an area of his lawn where the grass is really, like it was thin, the grass didn't look that good. And I'm like, man, it's gotta be, it's gotta be something going on here. There's no shade. So we took a screwdriver and tried to put it into the soil and literally went down like, like an inch. And I'm gonna see if I can find that, that video to be able to show you guys. Cause it's, um, it was, uh, it's interesting. So I guess what I'm trying to say too, Jacob is when you're going through all this trouble, you got a new place, new construction, 
you put in the, the irrigation system in, you know, if you have parts of your lawn that you're looking at right now and it's, they're struggling and you can't, it doesn't seem like there's any good reason for it. Check and make sure there's no debris under the soil because that is going to, that's going to have a really negative effect on how well um, the grass grows. You know what I mean? You're going to be tearing up the lawn anyway for, for doing the sprinkler system. If there's like rocks or, um, you know, concrete washouts that they, that they, that they left like big chunks of concrete in your lawn, cleaning that stuff out, getting that stuff out, get out of your lawn sooner than later is a good thing because it's going to it's going to prevent the frustration that's going to come from you doing all this stuff you know you're, you're fertilizing your lawn you're mowing it and you got some areas that are just not looking as good as other areas and you can't figure out why and it's because there's some kind of garbage um in the um the soil so let me see um let me see i think debris i'm trying to think of um i, I forget what i actually call the video but it's um uh, but I'll, 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 while I'm answering the next question, I'll go through, I'll search through my, uh, my videos here and I'll, I'll see if I can find it and I'll link it to you here in a second. Thanks again for the super chat. If you need anything else, definitely let me know. All right. Next up we have, let me see, where did I leave off? We have Jermaine, we have M2 Flyer, we already covered that. We got Doug super chat. Um... We have, oh, there we go. We got um, um, M, M2 or MU2 uh, Flyer says, we really don't have anybody on the West Coast on YouTube helping us out. Um, have conflicting methods of leveling uh, tall fescue, please help. Well, what, what are the conflicting methods, M2 fly, MU Flyer? I guess gold, I guess gold Flyer. Um, what are the conflicting methods that you're hearing about? The one thing I would, I would say is that that, that I would not do that we typically do in warm season lawns when it comes to leveling is we, the cutting heights tend to be a bit shorter, right? So, you know, if you're maintaining a Bermuda, if you're leveling a Bermuda lawn, right? And you're keeping the lawn at like two inches, I'd say, hey, listen, even though it's, it, the lawn may look a little bit ugly, you're you're gonna make the process a whole lot easier if the lawn is shorter. Reason being is, I mean, if you're trying to work a, a leveling rake through two inches of grass, it is more work and it's also harder to see like the high and low spots versus if your lawn is at an inch or so. So if you can get your lawn to, you know, inch and a quarter or, or, or lower, it does make spreading the material um, a lot easier. And so while that's good advice for a Bermuda lawn and for a zoysia lawn, not great advice for like a St. Augustine lawn or a, a tall fescue lawn. If you do that, you're going to, you're going to make, you're going to make the lawn mad. You know what I mean? Because those grass types do not like being cut, um, being cut super short. I found it. Here we go. I uh, found the video. Uh, those, those, those types of lawns don't really like being cut short. So if you can, um, so for a fescue lawn, I would say you're going to want to maintain the lower end of the available cutting range. So I don't, I'm not sure if a fescue, if you can cut it at like three inches, if it'll do, if it'll, if it'll tolerate that. If you can get it down to three inches, that's going to make it easier to spread. Um, and whenever you're doing your leveling, uh, you're picking out your leveling mix, I am, while you can do sand, I'm a huge fan of, me, of ensuring there's some organic material in whatever you're using to, to top dress your lawn. So if you can get a 70-30 blend, that would be ideal. If you can get a 50-50 blend, that would be ideal. Um, you know, if all you care about is increasing the organic material, you don't even have to use sand. But if you do want, you know, the lawn to get level a little bit smoother and you want it to last, having some sand in the blend you use makes a lot of sense. 70-30 is what I recommend the most, but 50-50 can work, can work well too. Um, and, um, and outside of that, outside of that, I mean, the advice, most the rest of the advice really, really holds, holds true as well too, right? So aerating, still a good thing to do. Um, fertilizing prior to the, the, prior to the top dressing being applied, also a good thing to do. Biosimilars prior to the top dressing going down, also a good thing to do. So really, the the advice really is the same, with the exception of I would not scalp your lawn. I wouldn't bring I wouldn't bring the cutting height down super low like we do on our warm season lawns. Um, and um, and yeah, that's there's not really a lot of not really a whole lot of um, difference. So Ted Rogers is saying two and a half inches. Yeah, so if you get down to two and a half inches, if you can if you can get down that short, then uh, that low, then 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 by all means go for it. You know, because it's 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 not because. Um, there's a couple of, of reasons for that. It just makes, it makes the work easier. It makes the work easier. You know what I mean? It makes you spreading that material around a whole lot easier and it makes it um, easier for you to see the low spots in the lawn. So hope that helps. Um, there should be some YouTubers on, I think Dwayne is on the West Coast. I think Dwayne's World Party Time, excellent. Like Dwayne's World is on the West Coast, but he's not a fescue guy. I think he's, um, I think he's, uh, he, I know he's, he's Bermuda. He's got Bermuda. Uh, a Bermuda lawn, but he, I believe, is on the West Coast. 
So for those of you guys that were watching the video I was talking about on like lawn debris uh, is this one. So I found it, debris. You know, English is a horrible language to have to learn. We, have, you guys, we should be really happy that we speak English because there's a lot of words that that you, if you don't speak English, it makes no sense that they are pronounced the way they are pronounced, right? All right, so there you go. Um, there's the video on, on, on garbage in your lawn and the negative results it can have. So check that out. Hopefully you get some value out of that. All right, next up, we have Tony Turner. He says, my neighbors think I'm crazy because I mow every two days. Yeah, I mean, that's how it starts out, Tony. And I used to get the same thing. People would be like, what? You know, I even had people when I was mowing would drive by and they, um, this is many, many years ago. They would stop and be like, the lawn looks great. Why are you mowing? I'm like, well, you know, just, it can always be a little bit better. It needs, it needs a cut. And now they don't even stop. They just, they just like, they just stop by and they, they wave. You know, in the South, you know, we got the, you know, the bless your heart look, you know, which is, um, you know, if you're, if you're in the South, you know what bless your heart means. But anyway, they, they have the bless your heart. Like, you know, well, that, that's what Ron does. You know, bless his heart. He just enjoys messing with his lawn. And, and now what happens is that, that, um, that sickness, that, that, that disease of mowing, right? It tends to spread around and throughout the neighborhood. You got now Al, um, um, Alan, uh, Alex is doing it now. You got, you know, throughout the neighborhood, there's tons of folks around here that are, that are stepping their lawn game up, which is cool, right? So I would say just keep doing it. Eventually, if they care about their grass, they might, you know, they might, you might rub off on them. I'm not going to say they're going to mow every um, every two days like you're doing it, but they might mow twice a week. And if they do that, their lawns are going to look better. And let's face it, but good look, good looking lawns helps everybody, right? Helps the entire, helps the, the neighborhood, helps property values, makes everything look nicer. So I would just keep going at it. All right, uh, Ryan K says, people who mow at night are crazy. I've not done that. That's one I've not done. I've not done night mowing, mainly because I don't have any lights on my mower. If I had a light on my mower, I would might actually try it. You know, I, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not opposed to mowing at night. I, it'd be interesting to see how hard it would be to maintain the uh, the stripes if you are if you're mowing at night. You know what I mean? It'd be interesting to see how well that um how well it how, how hard it is to do that. Huh? <laughs> Something to try out. I mean, I've got lights. I got tons of lights here. I, I guess I could take some lights and just and put them outside on the lawn and try mowing one time at night. Ooh man, we got thunder. Yeah, that. That's that's definitely a no mowing happening today. I don't know if you guys want to see that. Let me know. I could, that could be a fun a fun video. It's probably going to turn out horribly because I can't think of like light like lighting the lawn and then filming that. It's probably going to be a mess. But um, we can try it. If you guys want to see me um, set up some lights and try mowing my lawn at night, uh, let me know. Drop a comment saying yeah, go for it, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see if I can make that see if I can make that happen. It's I'm not going to do the entire lawn. I'll pick like a section and do it because I don't have enough light to do the entire thing. All right, next up is Ryan Ludwig. He says, after top dressing in general, this is a good, this is what I'm, I've been getting here lately too. After top dressing in general, how long before the low spots grow? Ballpark range, please. Okay, so Ryan, it depends. It depends on how much material you're putting down, how long, um, like how much, how much you're covering up the existing grass. If you have Bermuda, so I'll tell you, I'll give you a bunch of ifs. If you have Bermuda grass, which grows quickly, if you have a lot of direct available sunlight, and you're in a part of the country like the Southeast where it's hot, you can expect the lawn to recover from top dressing fairly well within three weeks. If it's the first time within three weeks, you should see for the most part, it should have grown through all the, the light areas will be in week one, but the heavier areas by week three, it'll, the lawn will largely look pretty good um, after, after three weeks. If it's Bermuda, if it's hot, if it gets a lot of sunlight, yes, it'll, it'll recover faster. Now, if you will, if it's, you've, um, if it's your second or third time top dressing, you're gonna find that one, the top dressing is gonna be a lot lighter, so the lawn is gonna recover faster. Um, and in that case, it could be you know a week, ten days before you're back out there mowing again. So it, it really depends. It depends on how how heavy you do you do your top dressing and um, the available sunlight, you know, you're, where you are in the country. But in general, three weeks is a pretty good is a pretty good um, expectation to set because this time of year, the, I get email from people too. Oh, it's my first time I've top dressed my lawn. I totally mess it up. I don't know what's going on. You know, it's, it's week, it always happens. It's been one week. It hasn't grown through yet. I'm like, man, you just top dressed. It's your first time. You went a little bit heavy in these areas. It's going to be fine. The grass will grow through. It's Bermuda. You're not going to kill it. It's going to be absolutely fine. Especially if you top dress it the way that I suggest, which is not going crazy heavy. I think I've got some pictures of top dressing here. Let me see. I got some from last week. Let me see if I can find... 
If I can find some top dressing pictures here, um, uh, let me see here. Did James, yeah, this is a good one here. So this was James from like, this is from two weeks ago. So if your lawn looks like that, and this is not even watered in. If your lawn looks like that, when you're done top dressing, this is before you water it, that should be, and if you're getting plenty of sunlight, that should be, you know, three weeks or so before it um, it's looking looking a lot better. Uh, let's see if I have any other pictures of, uh, of top dressing here. Um, yeah, another example. If your lawn looks like this after you are done top dressing, then again, three weeks or so once you're done, it, um, three weeks from, from the time you're done top dressing it, it should grow through and be looking a lot better. Because you look at this one, this one checks all the boxes. The, um, the person that did this did not go crazy heavy. There's plenty of available sunlight, so a lot of direct sunlight hitting that Bermuda. And I know this person, they happen to live in the Atlanta area, so it's gonna be hot and you know, and the temperatures are, are, are good. So that lawn within three weeks is gonna be looking really solid. So hope that helps, Ryan. Give you some, give you some, some, um, some, uh, some considerations that will, that will affect how long it takes for your lawn um, to recover. But again, three weeks, I would, ex I would expect that. And there's some areas that may, at, at the three week mark, may not be fully grown through, but overall, the lawn should be looking really good after three weeks uh, whenever you, uh, you top dress. Here on Instagram, we got Offroad MB saying yes to mow under the lights. <laughs> uh, I want to get myself in trouble. Get myself in trouble, man. All right, next up is Diamond Shoddy. He says, any future streams of BYD again? Also, thanks on that Turflex reorder. You are very, very welcome, Diamond Shoddy. Uh, sorry for the breakage that you experienced in shipment. It happens, unfortunately. Um, and it's, yeah, anything's possible. As far as BYD getting on the live stream, it could happen again. I think the last time was October, right? It was like ho around Halloween, I think. Um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see if we're able to make it happen or not. Um, so I don't know. I'm not sure if um, I'm not sure um, what his schedule is like, but we'll, we'll we'll see about it. And again, guys, we got 100 folks here in the live stream. Only 55 likes. If you guys would not mind hitting that like button ever so gently, gives me also a second to um, to sip my coffee. And you know, I don't know if LG's here. He might be lurking. We'll even put on some some um, LG music while I sip my coffee and look for the next comment. See my coffee cup. Even though today it's raining, life is still good, right? Still got to enjoy it. All right. Mm, mm, mm. All right. So next up, we got Mr. Russell Murtha. He says, "Still dry in Bama until next week, and then rain every day." So here's the thing, Russell. If you are, I mean, with that in mind, let's not waste this because I mean, uh, so the middle it's the middle of the month. I mean, I'm not sure if you're top dressing, but I mean, if you've got a week where you know it's going to be a lot of rain afterwards and you were thinking about top dressing, it'd be a good time to get it done. You know, I was I was talking, guys, here's the thing. I'm not sure if Alex is watching, but don't tell him. I mean, we're you guys remember, I said no major top dressing um, um, jobs this year. I was going to do the front lawn, which I've already done. But there's not going to be any major top dressing um, jobs at all being done, right? So I was over at Alex's yesterday where um, they graciously invited me over for lunch. And I said, yeah, man, you know, it's like I said, see, I kept, I kept my word. We're no big top dressing this year. And he, you know, here's the thing. He brought it up. He was like saying, yeah, you know, maybe some spot, maybe some spot leveling. I might, you know, get like one yard. We can do some spot leveling. I was like, oh, oh really? Yeah. I mean, if we, if you, if you want to do that, I am, I am completely in support of us doing some spot top dressing. I'm good with that. But the same thing, you know, you, it's a, it's a way to ruin a friendship if every time, every year, you know, there's this weekend of there's nothing but like tons of heavy work, but this time it was his idea. So I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, hold him to that. I'm going to see if we can get some uh, some leveling mix out here and get some spot top dressing done. And we'll film it, live stream it or something if you guys um, if you guys want to watch that. But I don't think he's watching right now. And if he is, um, it was your idea. All right, so next up we got uh, Higgy Pop. He says, let's all hit that like button. It's free. Thank you so much, Higgy. It is free. Hit that like button. It's a great and free way to support the channel. Next up, we got Jacob. He is back. He says, thanks for all the info, Ron. I have a, we already, I think I already answered that one as far as your question. We got T-1000, the Terminator, not the T-1000. So you're the, you're the previous version of the Terminator. You got the T-2000, the T uh, T-1000. So it's good morning. Hope you're doing well. And then, uh, let's see. Um, Higgy Pop says, I made an error. I made an error, misread the label and put down Three times the rate of liquid chelated iron. Any advice? I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, this at this point, it's like pregnancy. There's only one way out of this, right? I mean, it's you, you, we're we're already here. You already put down you already put down the, the iron, so you're just gonna have to wait it out and see what what's gonna likely happen, Higgy. 
depending on the amount of iron that you ended up using, I mean, I don't know what product you use, um, is the lawn is gonna get really, really dark green. It's gonna look really, really dark green um, at first. And then when when I have over applied iron, because there was one time I did it years ago when I was still using a product called, um, oh, Grant Supreme Green. That's what it was. It was a pr product uh, years ago, a liquid product. I wanted to see, you know, what happens if you apply too much iron to a lawn, like if you, or if you go higher in, in, in iron amounts. Um, and what I found is at first, um, the, a couple days later, it turned like a really dark, like really super dark green. And then a couple days later, it went from dark green to like almost like a um, like a gray, like a purplish gray color, which I didn't really like. I mean, it still looked okay, but it looked um, it looked weird, <laughs> was the best way of saying it. And then um, by two weeks, after a total of two weeks elapsed, it went back to its normal color. So it went from super, super dark to this kind of like dull, like gray, purplish, uh, dark color, um, and then back to green and then back to how it normally is. So you, you it's unlikely that you, that you, you didn't do any, I doubt you did any permanent damage, I guess if that's what you're asking, but just be prepared that if you went very, very heavy, um, I don't know what three times the label rate of whatever product what you're doing equates to, is at first it's gonna look really awesome, then it's gonna look a little bit weird, and then it's gonna look pretty good again, and then it's gonna go back to how it was looking before you did the iron kicker. So, um, so yeah, like like most things, guys, like more is not better. And I'm sure you just you just made a you made a mistake. But the thing that I get email about more than anything else, saying, well, you know, I just I went I over applied or I went like double the rate or three times the rate. By far, email that I get about is about this is about about Primo about growth regulator. Right? I can't tell you how many times I get email from folks saying, yeah, so I applied Primo at like three times the rate and my lawn, I've got like some tip burn. And I'm like, yeah, so why did you do that? Because the, the thing with this, literally, okay, so I'll, I'll show you. So for a, a Bermuda grass lawn, right? For Bermuda grass lawn, hybrid Bermuda, the low end of the application rate of Primo is, I'll show you here, if I can make this happen, is, is that much over the course of a month, over a thousand square feet. So a quarter of an ounce, that much, that much, remember this is a four ounce bottle, this is a small bottle, that much of that is all you need for a month, right? So people, especially people that spray the first time will look at this and they'll be like, there's no, there's no way that little amount is gonna work. There's no way that could actually do it. So what they do, they say, well, you know, I'm just gonna go, you know, if, if 0.25 is good, you know, 0.5, like that much, over a thousand square feet, it's gotta be better, right? And that's just not the case. I mean, it's, you think about it, like it's in Syngenta's best interest to sell as much of this stuff as possible, right? But if the manufacturer tells you to only use this much of the product, you know, over a thousand square feet for your particular grass type, stick to that um, because if you do, if you do more, you're gonna have, you're gonna have adverse effects, right? Like everything, like, like anything in life, or anything, yeah, anything in life taken too far is, um, is bad. Too much water, not good for you. You know, too much Primo, not good for you. Too much fertilizer, not good. So just stick to those label rates. Higgy, the nice thing with, with that, I mean, you're applying a micronutrient, so it, it's better, I'll put it to you this way. It's better that if, um, or just say the results, the negative results you're gonna have from over applying iron are not gonna be nearly as bad as like the results from like over applying nitrogen. Like if you did like three times the amount of N, like that, you're gonna see a negative result from, and that's that's gonna stick around a lot longer. Whereas, you know, three times the amount of, 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 of iron, again, it's, um, your, your lawn might turn like, um, like dark, like a, it's like a gray um, purplish color, and uh, then it'll go back to normal. So it's like a two week, two week period of the lawn looking kind of weird. So hope that helps. Uh, next up is Mr. Matthias Van Roy. You must be, you must be Dutch. Anytime we get like, um, like Armin Van Buren, like a DJ I used to really like back in the day when I was really into a lot of trance music. So Armin, and he's like Van, like a, fr a, a friend of mine that I grew up with, I used to play tennis with, um, Bas van der Hoorde. So when I see like Vanda, anything, I always think, oh, it must be German, German or Belgian. And he is from the Netherlands. He says, hey, from the Netherlands. He says, what is the best thing to do when you walk a lot on the lawn? Hmm. I guess the question you're asking is, um, so are you saying that you have a lot of wear or wear or from um, from people walking on it a lot? Uh, you know, if, I'm not sure what you, what you, actually what your question is, but if, if you have parts of the lawn that are having problems because people are constantly walking there, you got two options. Option one is you can make them just stop doing that. Like you can just walk on the lawn less or you can do something like what one of our entrants that in our contest did. So you could take something like this, 
like a mod, um, like a mod. So if you look at his lawn, I shall get your comment up here. So you can see he has, I think some, maybe like a patio or something over here on the left-hand side I couldn't see. And then here on the right-hand side is his house. Um, and you see he put pavers in, like little like stone decorative pavers in there. You could do something like that. Like that is gonna give some people something to walk on that is not, that's going to reduce the amount of wear that you have in your, um, you know, in your lawn. Um, let me put your question back up. Um, but outside of that, outside of that, um, again, I, I don't know what the, what the question is. I mean, as far as helping the lawn tolerate or recover from that, if you're feeding it properly, like you're giving it, you know, um, you're, you're feeding it a, 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 the correct amount of fertilizer for your particular grass type, if you're mowing it regularly, that will also can, stimulate growth and help the lawn recover from it. But if it's a, a, a situation where people are just always walking on it, like it's a, like a, a path in your lawn to get somewhere, your options are just have them to stop doing that or have, you know, reduce the amount of traffic or put like some kind of hardscape like pavers or decorative stones like you saw there in to help um, keep the wear off the grass onto something that, that tolerates it a bit better. So hope that, um, hope that helps. Appreciate you um, uh, uh, tuning in from the Netherlands. Cause again, that's, I mean, I grew up in the Netherlands until you know, I'm from um, a group in, I was born in St. Croix, but I grew up in St. Eustatius, which is part of, still under the crown, still under, um, Stacia Seba, Stacia Seba, and I think Baneer are still under are still under Holland. I mean, Curacao and St. Martin are still they still have a relationship, but they're but they're kind of more independent. Um, but yeah, we are still we are still very much under under the uh, Netherlands. We're still part of the Netherlands Antilles. All right. Next up is Thomas Norris. He says, "What do you think about liquid aeration?" I think if you're saying it, do I, what do I think about liquid products that help reduce thatch? over time, um, I think that there is value in them. I do not think they are as good as hollow time aeration. So in other words, liquid aeration is not going to produce the same results as far as, we can find CJ's picture again, is not gonna reduce the same, produce the same results as uh, that. So you see that, that picture there where a lawn has been hollow time aerated, like where you actually pull plugs out of the lawn, like liquid aeration is not gonna relieve compaction to the same level that that is. So I, I think if you if you can't do aeration or you don't want to do aeration, um, it's better than nothing, but it is not um, it's not on the same, it's not even remotely on the same level as far as relieving compaction like a um, like an actual hollow tine aerator can can produce. What I would say is do both of them. Like if you can use uh, a liquid, um, if you can do hollow tine aerating and then use like a liquid aeration product, I mean you think about it, like for example, to you take like um you take like um, the biostimulants that we sell in the golf course lawn store, right? Like these technically could be considered liquid aeration products. Like um, any of the release products, like the like the Nutri Kelp, would could be considered liquid a liquid aeration product. Um, let me go over here to the biostimulants. It's better better look. So like the release zero could be considered that. Nutri Kelp could be considered that. Um, the um, the biospectrum, which helps increase soil microbial activity, like the like these mixed together. Like if you took like the carbon kit especially the one that's the non-fertilizer carbon kit, like the this one, this guy right here, the 5,000 square foot one, this is, that's nutri kelp, release zero, and then the soil microbial activity, uh, the, the soil microbes, this could be considered liquid aeration, right? I don't market it as such, I don't, I don't put that, I don't put that like front and center in the, in the description because I, I, I would consider this something that you do in addition to everything else. So I would, I would say if you are going to use, again, if you, if you can't do any kind of um, hollow tine aeration, any kind of mechanical aeration, it's better than nothing. But I would consider those liquid products something that you do in addition to, to, um, to the, the mechanical means. You know what I mean? You, so, so I hope that helps. I mean, it's better than nothing, um, but it's not, it's not as good. It's not even in the same universe as, as mechanical aeration. Here, here's a good way to know that. If it were as good, if you could use a liquid product and it would aerate your lawn, and have the same benefits that like hollow tine aeration does, golf courses would do it. Like they wouldn't go through the trouble of like shutting down greens and making a big mess of the greens and the, the course by aerating the, aerating the greens and aerating the fairways, right? They would just use a liquid product, but they don't do that because it's not as good. It, just, it doesn't, like as far as relieving compaction and allowing air, water, nutrients to, to get in the soil, um, like, like hollow tine, like mechanical aeration can do, um, liquid aeration just doesn't do that. It's just not, it's just not as good. I mean, it's beneficial, just not as good. Um, and if you want to learn, learn more about aeration, Thomas, um, we have a blog on that topic. So if you go to guides on the golf course, on and blogs, 
Oh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? I think it's on page two now. So if you go to the second page, there, how to core aerate your lawn. Talks about what core aeration is, the benefits of doing it, um, tips and tricks, um, things you want to keep in mind, um, the prep work, all this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, so I will, I'll send this to you uh, to, to talk to, to help convince you that yes, if you got the liquid aeration products, they're fine. They're good. I mean, I spray them on my lawn twice a month but they are not as good as hollow tine aeration, as, as the mechanical stuff. And here's the thing, if you don't want to do it yourself, I get it, because it's a lot of work. It's a, I mean, it's, you, you do question your life choices whenever you're out there with an aerator. It's, it's, it's a beating. Um, it's, a, or a beating. it's a workout, it's a serious workout. But you can just pay someone to do it for you. You just pay a service. There's tons of services that'll come out and they'll, they'll you know, you pay them $100 or whatever they, or they're charging these days, they'll come out and, you know, an hour later, less than that, if your lawn is smaller, they're done. And then you don't have to worry about it. So. Um, it's worth doing. It's a lot of benefits to it, and you don't necessarily have to do it your, uh, yourself. All right, Matthias Vedvori says, Hi from the Netherlands. Love your program. My la my grass is a little flat because of walking. Okay, yeah. So I get what you're saying. If you can reduce that, um, uh, Mathis, like, oh, like I was saying, if, you, if it's an area where it's like a sidewalk or, or a, a walking path, maybe not having grass there or putting some pavers in, like some flat stones in that people can walk on, uh, that will help the grass not get mashed out as much. But here's the thing, I, and I didn't cover this, but it's, it's a consideration, is that by doing that, if you put those like stones or pavers in the lawn to keep the grass from getting flat, while that's gonna make the grass look nicer, you are creating more work for yourself because you have to edge around them, you have to mow around them. Like if you look at this picture here, like of a mod's lawn, like this looks really cool, but like you got to be really careful. You, you got to be careful running a mower anywhere near these because you don't want to damage the mower. So a lot of times you're going to be stuck with using a string trimmer or an edger or some kind of sort to make it look, the lines look defined. So while you can do that, while you can put pavers in, you're trading, well, you're trading one problem for another. You're trading, you're trading one, you're fixing one issue, but you're creating work in another, another space. You know what I'm saying? So you have to kind of think, you know, which problem, there is no free lunch in life. Which problem do, do you want to have? I guess is what, I'm, is what I'm trying to get to. All right, next up we have uh, um, um, Doug 350Z says, my neighbor asked about, actually, no, before I do that, I have a super chat. Let me get down here and grab that really quick. Doug, stand by. Um, uh, actually, no, we'll answer your question. Sorry already got it. Says, my neighbor I asked um, is about, my neighbor I asked about the pest is a woman and she does all her yard work. Her husband got embarked and when she was leveling and she told me, okay, Cool. Yeah, that's that's uh, that works, um, Doug. So I will look into that. I'll look into finding out about um, us control, uh, controlling that insect using the the pest control. I got a screenshot of it, so I will um, I'll get an answer for you. And I think I think you've emailed me because you've sent me pictures before. But your your name isn't Doug three fifty Z is a problem. So whatever your real name is, you got to just email me again, and I will I'll get you an answer today. I'll get an answer for you today as far as that goes. All right. So we have our super chat. One from. Kwambi, Kwambuena Kumbi. Thank you so much, sir. Super chat received. He says, I'm looking for, re for real sharpening services in the Chicagoland area. Is DIY a real option? Pun intended. Um, yeah, no, you not, you can, um, so as far as real sharpening services in the Chicagoland area, I don't, I don't know. Uh, you can check, like, I think Real Rollers still has that. Let me make sure before I send you there. I think they still have, they have the grinder finder. Uh, da, 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 da. find, yeah, I think they still do. Let's see here. Yeah, so if you were to, um, I don't know, what, what is what is the zip code in Chicago? I don't know. Um, but anyway, so if you were to go here, let me switch over real quick. So if you go to Real Rollers website, realrollers.com, right? And if you go to, um, find a service shop and you go to grinder finder uh, search and then you put in a zip code. I don't know a zip code in Chicago. So I'll just say Chicago, maybe it'll find it. Let's see. And it does look at that, man. They thought of everything. Cool. So in the Chicago land area, it looks like, um, well, there's an Indiana, there's Kirk's place and there's a uh, Greg's lawnmower in Lake bluff, Illinois. So I'm, there might be others or there likely are others, but those are the two that um, that popped up. Mind you, these are just people that are shops that have registered for uh, to you know to be on Real Rollers on their service. So there's probably other ones, but I mean it's a good it's a good start. And if you want that uh, Quambi, I will link that here at uh, Quambi. Uh, 
there you go. That's how you can find them. But I don't have um, I don't have another option for you. Is DIY a real grinding an option? Not not really, because the machine that you need to do that. If you ever see what it takes to grind a um, a reel, um, it's a it's a pretty involved process. Um, and if, if you're talking about grinding, no, I don't think you can do that yourself. If you're talking about backlapping, that you can do. So Real Rollers, the same company I just sent you a link for, they sell backlapping kits. And what that basically equates to is like a um, like an abrasive paste. Like I think they sell like an 80 and 120 grit paste. And it comes with a paintbrush. And you can use that to, um, to restore the edge on your reel. So between grinds, you can use that to restore an edge. So, so that you can do. So backlapping, yes, you can do yourself. Actually grinding the reel is not something that most people can do because they don't have the machine to do it. The machines are really expensive and it wouldn't be worth it um, for a homeowner to, to own one of them. So hope that helps you between, um, you know, the link I sent you there for their, their, their tool, the grinder finder tool. And then also look on their website as well for the, um, their backlapping, um, compound. They have some backlapping, they have the compound, they also have some kits as well. So, uh, that will, that will make that, that process easier. Uh, thanks so much for the super chat. I really do appreciate it. If you need anything else, let me know. So we got one more super chat, super chat received. from Doug. He says, sorry, that comment was to Dustin asking how to get his wife to cut the lawn. Oh, okay. It wasn't for me. I was about to say, I wasn't, I wasn't sure what you were talking about. All right. So scrolling back up, I will find out now where we left off. Yes. Yeah, so we got, uh, 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 we got a uh, forever Bermuda. No, let me, let me let, I'm, I'm, that's, I'm still too high. Still too high in the live stream. I'm too, too high in the comment section. I think, uh, yeah, here we go. Um, next up is Matthias Roy. He says, by the way, do you send products to the Netherlands? No, not really. I mean, the shipping of getting stuff over, there's a couple problems with doing it. One, the shipping would be crazy expensive. In, in most cases, the shipping would cost more than the product does. And then, um, you know, while some of those products, some products like our biosimilar products likely wouldn't be too much of an issue. Like there's also this getting them through customs and if they're registered there and all this kind of thing. So it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of headache. Um, to where it, it only works if everything works out. And, you know, I don't want, the last thing I would want you to do is to order something and then it get held up in customs or get damaged while it's going over there. So it just, there's, there's too many ways for you to have a bad experience, which is why we just don't even, we don't really even look into it. You know, it's just, it's not, um, it's not something that's, uh, that, that we're looking to do right now. Cause there's, there's a lot of, a lot of challenges to overcome to be able to make that happen. All right, next up we got is Mr. Fairway Bermuda. Daryl's in the house. He says, listening to the lawn talk while editing videos. Cool, thanks, Ron. Nice, man. What you working on? What kind of, you got it? Can you give us a sneak peek? What's the video gonna be on? You can, can you tell us? You can uh, you give us a sneak peek, uh, Daryl. Come on, let us know. What you, what you, uh, what you editing? Um, uh, next up, and if, guys, if you guys like Bermuda, um, you know, if you like like uh, content on Bermuda grass, uh, check out Fairway Bermuda Lawn. Like uh, that's Daryl. It's a good a good buddy of mine. He uh, you know he does does some good content. He started his YouTube channel. I think you're, you're on year two now at least, uh, Daryl. Right, at least year two. So uh, so just give him some support. He makes puts out good content. Uh, next up, we have a question from Gazias One Eleven. It says, "Can you apply Primo Max after applying a liquid fertilizer?" Yes, you can. Yes, you can. But even better, the, the question you asked is, can you apply it afterwards? Yes, but even better, I would apply them at the same time. So whenever I apply Primo, then again, I, I think I've said this on the stream before, I don't think, I can't recall, at least not in recent years, not in the last five years or so, there's been a time when I've applied only Primo Max. I'm pretty much always mixing it with something. So in most, at a minimum, it's gonna be Primo and a liquid fertilizer of some sort. So I'll show you guys. Um, what I what like blend normally is if you go to shop and go to lawn fertilizer, um, what I'm typically blending Primo mix, Primo Max with is the carbon kit. So um, that is Release Zero, Nutri Kelp, and uh, Biospectrum. So those go in the tank, and then a a, a liquid fertilizer like Turfplex um, or 901C. Either one of these guys will. If, if I do the 901C carbon kit, then that. Can that's that will work by itself, um, but if not, you can use Turfplex along along with Primo. So yes, to answer you, the question you asked, yes, you can. If you want to go out and spray liquid fertilizer and then go spray uh, Primo afterwards, you can do that. But it's um, you're just creating more work for yourself. Like you literally can mix them at the same time. That's the that's the beauty of it is you can mix Primo with like I I mix it with uh, one two three four at least four. Uh, no, let me take it. at least three, three other things. So at minimum, it'll be 901C, 
um, NutriKelp and Biospectrum, and um, the, like those three will go in the tank. Um, if I'm using Turfplex, then it'll be really zero Turfplex, NutriKelp, Biospectrum, and um, you know that, and those all go in the tank together. If you want to put a micronutrient in there, like a liquid micronutrient, like Nutrizol, you can do that too. And they, the nice thing is that all the liquid fertilizers that we have um, from Bloomplex up, right? Like so, Bloomplex, Nutrizol, Turfplex, 901C, NutriKelp. Um, release zero. We've tested. I've, I personally have tested all those together. I've tested mixing them, um, and they all played nicely together. So you can, you can, uh, you can, you can feel confident. You can mix Primo with any of those, and you're going to get a, uh, a good result. There's not going to be any any weird interactions. So hope that helps. You're very well, welcome. You said uh, thank you. You're very welcome. If you need anything else, let me know. And yeah, definitely don't don't get out there and go spray your lawn with with Primo and then go out and spray liquid fertilizer. That's just that's too much work. I mean, do it all at once. That's that's the that's if there's any reason to get into liquids um, as far as you're using liquids in your lawn care program. That's a that's a huge part. Is that you're able to just do all? You're able to stack a lot of this stuff and just save save time. You know what I mean? All right. Next up is Gerald Jennings. Gerald Jennings. He says, um, Ron, how would you describe the results of the organic fertilizer that you're using on your front lawn? I like them. They're they're good. The color looks the color looks good. Um, the thing I would say is this: is that compared to, uh, so I'll show you guys because you, you're not sure. Not, you guys don't know what he's talking about. Um, if you go to um, to here, I'll show you what I'm actually using on the lawn. So on the on the back lawn, I'm using Humic Max. This is the synthetic. So Humic Max is the granular fertilizer that's being used on the back lawn, and on the front lawn, I'm using the Miramichi, um, the premium organic, right? So this is a triple four, and this is a sixteen zero eight. So the thing that I've noticed between the two, the color looks great on both both lawns, right? The thing that I, I do find is that the color response from the organic takes longer to ramp to, to come in than Humic Max does, which you kind of expect, right? You mean it's an organic fertilizer, it's um it's just gonna take it's gonna be slower than um than 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 Humic Max. Something else to keep in mind too is that the rate that I'm applying the amount of of um of nitrogen that I'm I'm applying with the triple four is a bit less. I'm I'm around like 0.35 pounds of nitrogen from the from the um from the Miramichi organic versus half a pound of nitrogen from um, from Humic Max, uh, but but as far as if, I'll put it this way, if I, if I applied them both at the beginning of the month, by um, by a week and a half in, they both look great. Um, but as far as the ramp up time, Humic Max looks looks better. The back lawn looks better faster um, than the organic does because it's one is organic and one is synthetic. So that's there is that. So um, but they're they're both excellent. I love the way the you guys have seen pictures of of the front lawn and the color looks great. Um, yeah, I mean no no complaints at all. And the nice thing about that about the premium organic is that it's um, in, in addition to it having being a complete fertilizer. You also there's also a microbial package that that Miramichi put in there as well. So whereas Humic Max doesn't have that, the complete none of the synthetics have that. The the premium organic does have it. So the same package that goes into their the product they make for Site One in in uh, for Car Carbon Pro G, that same um, bacteria package goes into the organic. So it's it's kind of cool from that standpoint. So yeah, they're both they're both great. Um, it really just depends on which way you want to go. There's some people that really love organic fertilizers. They just want organics because you know they just they don't want any synthetics on their lawn it's for whatever reason. So this um, this fits the bill for that. As far as options go, given the coverage you get from this, 7,200 square feet out of out of a single bag delivered, you know, it's at, for like 70 bucks, um, it's a better deal than Malorganite or other competing. Uh, uh, granular, um, uh, granular organic fertilizers. So yeah, I mean nothing, no, no negatives at all. I mean because it's slower release, it's not gonna, not gonna burn your lawn. But also because it's slower release, it takes longer to see the response than say Humic Max or the complete fourteen seven fourteen or the the stress uh, the the twelve zero twenty four. Right. So that's um, that's the, the biggest difference between that between the synthetic and the organic. But that's gonna be true for any organic versus synthetic. Synthetic fertilizers are by definition are going to um, you're gonna see you're gonna see a response, a color response a bit faster than you will with the with organics. So hope that helps, Gerald. They're both great. I um I like them both. I'm gonna to continue to run that, the the triple four on the front lawn throughout the rest of the season, and I'm gonna to continue to run Humic Max in the back lawn. Next up is Catherine Turner. She says, morning from Washington State. What's up, Catherine? Hope you're doing well. She says, morning from Washington State. Our FERT Micro and Essential G went down last week. Nice. I like it. 
Now just practicing patience, waiting for the results. So if you did it last week, again, five to seven days is when you start seeing a color response. And the thing you can be doing while you're waiting um, for you know the colors to start coming in, Catherine, is mow. Get out there and mow. Make sure you're also mowing once you uh, once you do that. You know, once you you got and you you apply the products to your lawn. You know, if you're doing granulars or liquids, you're mowing. You know, get out there and and, and mow a lot. Remember, think about it. Um, you you apply a granular fertilizer to your lawn once per month, typically, right? If you're doing it the way that I do it, once per month, you get out there and you spray liquids. Even though I spray, you know, like a, a, a combination of products. I spray that twice per month. So granular, I'm out there once per month doing that. And then liquids, I'm out there twice per month. But I'm out there mowing every few days. So mowing is a big part of it. So you want to get out there and make sure you're keeping up with your mowing while you're, you know, after you've done your granular products so to make sure you're, you're maximizing your results. You want to make sure you're mowing um, regularly. That's a huge part of the lawn looking awesome. Doug says, I hit that like button, or he says, hit that like button, folks. Yeah, definitely, guys. If you guys are enjoying the show, please hit the like button. It's a free way to support the channel. I do appreciate it. Uh, Catherine has dropped a super chat. Thank you so much, Catherine. I appreciate you. Super chat received. Very nice. Thank you so much, Catherine. And she says, I forgot to ask, what's our best option for killing clover? Spectrocyte last month took care of our moths but didn't touch clover. Can I apply uh, now? What kind of grass do you have, Catherine? In Washington, I imagine it's going to be a warm season grass. Uh, I'm sorry, warm season. <laughs> Warm season on the green. Being in Washington, I think it's going to be a cool season grass. I was looking for something, looking for the product while I was, well, that was the thing when I was talking. Um, it's going to be a cool season grass like a fescue or a rye or KBG. I think Triad is labeled for clover. I want to say that it is. I think so. It's like a three-way. I think it's got, I think it's labeled for clover. It is. Yeah, it is. So if you, um, so what you can use, you could use Tenacity, but Tenacity is going to this color your lawn, and that's that's a bit overkill for clover. Um, I would say go with something like this. So switch over. Something like Triad, um, that will work well for um, for knocking out clover in your lawn. And the nice thing about this is you can use it on on cool season and warm season lawns. So this is a good, it's a good three ways, it's a good option um, for knocking out, um, for, for treating for treating clover in your lawn, uh, Catherine. So I'll send you a link to this. Um, if you're trying to kick it up a notch, you can mix some surfactant along with it. So you can take like Triad and you can add an ounce, an ounce or so of the spreader sticker. That will help. That will help enhance your results that you get with using it. Um, but yeah, uh, knowing without knowing what kind of grass you have, uh, then I would I'm going to say Triad because pretty much anything that you can spray um, spectrocyte on. If I'm thinking if it's the orange bottle. Uh, triad would also work well on those grass types as well too. So, um, and actually, you could probably do more with um, with Triad than you can with Spectrocyte because because Triad doesn't have quinclorac in it. I don't believe so. Let me look at the yeah. It doesn't have it doesn't have quinclorac in it. So you can actually spray this on more grass types than you can even the Spectrocyte. Um. So yes, yeah, so I'll send you a link to that. Um, Catherine, and I'm assume I'm assuming that you have cool season grass, given that you're in Washington. You're in Washington State, but if you want to email me um, to to chat it up and just to confirm, um, I'm happy to do that. So that is um, that is the herbicide, and then this is the surfactant that I would I would use along with it to help to help maximize your results. And again, if you, and if you don't have my email, it is uh, Ron at golfcourselawn.com. So you can drop me an email right there real quick and say, hey, my grass is this, or leave a, a comment and let me know what kind of grass you have, and uh, then we'll we'll go from there. All right. So Ferber Bermuda Daryl says it's uh, season two, uh, buddy. I'm adding a DIY my DIY sprinkler system. Cool. That's nice. So he's he's doing a DIY sprinkler system. Very very cool, uh, Daryl. We will look out for that. We'll look out for that video whenever you drop it. Okay. Next up after the super chats is KT Patriots. Um, says, do I have to water it propiconazole uh, 143? I sprayed on June 8th, didn't water it in, and I'm starting to think I wasted my time and product. There, in mo yes, in most cases, yes. You are they are designed, like most fungicides, you read the labels, they're designed to be watered in after applications. So if you apply, if you have like um, propiconazole standalone, if you have azoxystrobin standalone, if you have a blended product like Pillar um, in a liquid, or you have a granular product like Headway, they're all designed to be watered in after application. So, um, did you waste it? Um, if you didn't get any kind of water, in other words, if you if you've applied it and you didn't, you've not received any kind of water uh, at all, like it hasn't rained, like shortly after you applied it, or you haven't run irrigation, 
then you're probably not getting as much out of it as you could have, you know, if you would versus if you had watered the product in. Um, but the, the thing is, if it's June 8th, you know, if you want to do another application three weeks, well, June 8th is really the end of this month, uh, July, that would likely be okay. Um, but, but yeah, you, you, insecticides, insecticides and fungicides. Insecticide, fungicide, pre-emergent. Those are three um, products that in general, again, there are, there are exceptions to the fungicides and insecticides. If you're dealing with some like, like an active insect problem, some of them don't want to have you watered in, but in general, for a fungicide or an insecticide, they are designed to be watered in after application. Uh, so yes, you should have watered it in when you were done. Chris Hunnigan says, I'm thinking about getting an irrigation system put in. Should I put in the irrigation, the fertigation feature, like the hunter system, or continue to put down my granular treatments? I hear they get clogged. I mean, I don't have any direct experience with uh, with fertigation, um, Chris. But I would say this: the the the, the issue with those with those um, types of systems is the products. Like, the, you can't just use any product in them, right? You have to use products that are designed to be used with fertigation systems. So, if it were me, if it were me, um, you know, for your reason as well, you say they get they get clogged. Um, you know, it's just there's just there's just more involved in them. If it were me. I would just do a traditional irrigation system, or maybe even one of these new smart, these new smart irrigation systems that you see people using. The ones that, that allow you to um, to use like waypoints to like make the sprinkler throw less or or more water. Like it can shoot it further or shorter. Like something like that, you could use it. You could install, but I would do a traditional type irrigation system. So either like a smart irrigation controller or smart irrigation system, or you're just your traditional, you know, um, you know your PGP. Um, your, your traditional, like, you know, a sprinkler head, something like that, um, versus a fertigation, because unless you have a set of products that you really like that, and they are already set up or designed to be used with fertigation, then I, I think, um, that, that, that you're not, you're not going to get, you're not going to use that feature as much as you might, as you might think you will. So for me, I would just, just do a, a standard irrigation system if, if it were me. Um, you know, if you want, do something like what the lawn tools did there. I think they did a, I'm not sure if they did a video on it, but on their, in their shorts, they recently did one of those smart, um, irrigation systems. The new ones you see all over the internet all the time that, that, that they will, they'll, they'll spray along your sidewalk and they'll get, they'll, they'll stop spraying as much when they get closer to your, to your mulch beds. Like if you want to do something, something like that, if you're trying to go t t take it up a notch, um, that is about as far as I personally would go. I wouldn't do fertigation if it were me. If it were me. All right, next up, we got a super chat from Tom Morris. Thank you so much, uh, Tom. I appreciate that. Super chat received. And then uh, while I'm scrolling for the next comment, Devin just jumped in. He says, what's up, Ron? Sunday turf talk with a, sup of with a cup of coffee. Nice. Yeah, man. I got rained out uh, as far as mowing today. So I figured why not just hang out with you guys. You fine folks that are either also not able to mow or just want something to do on a Sunday morning. We can hold we can hold lawn care church. How about that? We can just just chat it up and have a good time just chatting about uh, lawn care. So I figured, why not? I didn't want to be denied, so I'm out here talking, chatting with you guys. All right, next up is Patrick Troy. He says, "Good morning, Good morning, Patrick. Hopefully you're doing well." Raging Wookie eating cookie. <laughs> uh, yes, Raging Cookie Wookie eating. Cookie. That's an awesome handle, by the way. He says, "Are there any concerns with chemicals interacting with each other if you spray multiple ones at once?" Yes, there are. There are. It's a great. It's a great point. So if you are spraying products that you've never tested before, like you've, not te you've never done a test of that combination, um, the way you do that is by doing what's called a jar test. So if you take like literally a jar, you want to use a bigger one than this, um, a jar, a bigger one like this, right? You would mix a small amount of the different products that you are planning on using. I mean, not one with fertilizer in it, obviously. Um, Add, obviously add water and then agitate it and then let it sit for, you know, five, 10 minutes and see if there's any, if anything weird happens, like if it separates, if it starts gelling or doing anything weird. Um, and then if you, if that happens and you know that combination, I can't mix them because, you know, and, and the thing is you want to find that out with a small amount of product versus mixing up, you know, four gallons of it. And then you have a big mess on your hands. Uh, the thing is these product, the, the liquid fertilizers that we carry on the golf course lawn store, raging cook, wookie eating cookie, I have I've personally tested these and they don't they all play nicely together. So the carbon kit, so release release zero or release 901C along with NutriKelp and Biospectrum, you can mix them with Bloomplex, with Nutrizolf, with Turfplex. 
And with Primo, there's no weird interactions. There's no negative interactions as far as like any kind of like gelling or separation or anything like that. I have I have done the work or the hard work for you. I've tested them and there's no there's no problems. If you are spraying, or if you're mixing any of these with something else, so say you're using Primo and the carbon kit, right? But you're using a different liquid fertilizer. Again, liquid fertilizers typically you don't tend to have too many problems with that, um, but still, uh, just to be safe, uh, mix a small amount of it, a small amount in a jar, and just make sure nothing weird is happening before you mix up a big a big bunch of it. So, uh, so yeah, there are concerns with that. For products that are more that are where there's where they're that are susceptible to it, you'll see it actually called on the labels. Like so, certain um, post-emergent herbicides, certain. Um, like fungicides, you'll see that as well too. You'll see them, they'll say, you know, if, if planning on mixing this product with anything else, perform a jar test. And that's what they're talking about. Like you take that, take the, the product that you're, that you're read, that you're gonna apply and mix a small amount of it with water in a mason jar and see if anything weird happens. So, uh, so yeah, but typically for liquid fertilizers, you don't have too many issues in general. And, and the ones again, that we carry on the golf course lawn store, uh, they all play nicely together. All right, uh, Madam uh, is in the house. She says, hi, see you waving, what's going on? Next up is Alex. He says, like button pressed ever so gently. Thanks for showing my lawn on Friday. Just leveled, applied essential G and recovering nicely. Very, very cool, Alex, no worries. I think, do I have Alex's lawn? This is Alex, I think, this, there's only one Alex that I think that that uh, were submitted. So if this is Alex Plaza, then this is Alex's lawn. And it's, it's good looking lawn, man. Stripe action is on point. I really, I really did like this lawn. So yeah. Great lawn, can jo good job on, on, on the work that you're doing. The lawn's already looking great. And as you continue working with it, it's gonna get even that much better. That much better. That's Ahmad's lawn, that's not Alex's lawn, but it's also a great looking lawn too. All right, next up is Adam Carter. Adam Carter, he says, I watch um, Doc and he says, he talks about when you're buying a real mower, you need to buy the one that is the longest from side to side. So he says McLean, because they are 25 inch. Um, okay. I mean, I didn't, I haven't watched the video. I haven't watched the video to know if that's, if that's what he, what he actually said, Adam. Um, this, the, you buying the widest mower is not, I mean, it, I would not use that as the primary criteria of, of what real mower I buy. Um, I would not do that because you think about it, if you have a small lawn, so you have like a, a thousand, like a postage stamp lawn, like a, a, th a thousand square foot lawn or something, right? Or uh, 2000 square foot lawn, a relatively small lawn. Um, you know, the stripes that are gonna come out of a 25 inch mower, I mean, they'll look okay, but then it's something could be said for having a smaller mower, like a 20 inch mower, right? Like that's gonna be, it's gonna be easier for you to store. The stripes like visually are going to fit better. They're gonna look better. Like if you take a look, like you take a look at my lawn where it's, um, it's a big open space. There's the video of that. Um, so this is a, a video of my back lawn. This is actually, that, that's actually a, the stripes from a 20, uh, 27 inch wide with mower, right? And it's doubles, these are double wides, right? But that makes sense for my lawn because it's a really big lawn, it's a big property, right? So it makes sense for a larger lawn to have a wider mower so you can have wider stripes. Um, but I, I don't agree that everybody should buy the widest possible mower that they should buy. Just that doesn't make any sense, right? Because you like, a, <laughs> it's there are more factors other than that. Suppose you have like flower beds or other, you know, things in your, in your lawn, like you, that, you know, it may not, if you have a sidewalk nearby, there might be, there might be things that a wider mower is more of a cumbersome problem than, than a smaller mower would be, right? So in general, a small, for smaller lawns, a smaller mower makes sense, makes a lot of sense because they're easier to store. Um, they, the stripes are going to look, are going to look aesthetically, they're going to fit better than like really, really wide stripes on a small lawn. Um, so, so yeah, so if you have, if you have a wide lawn or a big, or a big lawn, then a, a, lar a wider mower makes sense. But I would not say that everybody should buy a, the longest from side to side, the, the widest, if, if I'm reading this properly, by longest from side to side, you're saying the widest. So I would not say that. And if, and if you are, let's just say, we'll play devil's advocate. If you are gonna buy the widest from side to side, then you should buy a true cut 27 inch or you should buy an Alit C27 or you should buy a, a Toro Greensmaster because a 1600, because all of those are wider than 25 inches. Like they make a 27 inch, a Greensmaster 1600 is 26 inches and an Alit is 27 inches wide. So if that is true, a McLean 25 inch is not the widest mower from side to side. There are other ones you should consider. So, um, and he says, cause it helps with bumps in your lawn. Eh, 
Um, yes and no. Um, the thing is that you that you're gonna find is that um, no, I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say that because like the thing that helps your the mower cut well on on a bumpy or on a bumpier lawn is if you have a front roller. Like having a front roller is going to make a bigger influence into how the mower handles on uneven surfaces than the width of the mower. So like, and I've got like, my lawn's kind of a poster child for that. I've got like an area, my back lawn is super flat, really wide. And um, I've got a front lawn that is um, that is sloped. And I also got a swale area that is, that's got like a bit of a slope to it and some uneven areas and some contours. And my 25 inch, my um, my 25 inch, my 27 inch, my 26 inch, they all cut that well. I've um, I've mowed it with, um, when I had the Sterling, the that one back there, the 20 inch, I cut, I did mow along the contour with that and it was just fine. The thing that made the biggest, that makes the biggest difference is having a front roller. If you have a mower like a True Cut, which can have caster wheels and also like this, even like this one here, like the uh, Allen, um, they make an, an option where you can buy um, wheels. You can replace the front roller with wheels, which is really more if you're cutting like taller grass with it. Like if you do that, then yes, you're gonna you're gonna start having you get you got to be really careful when you you're cutting an uneven lawn because scalping is gonna be, is gonna be more of a thing. But as far as the width alone being allowing the lawn the mower to do better on bumps or, or slopes in a lawn, not necessarily true. Like if you're cutting a lawn that is sloped. Take for example a lawn that is wide. Like say, my, say this is my front lawn, right? If you are cutting that a, mo a lawn that is sloped like this, I can hear both of you guys can see it. If you cut along the the length of the lawn, the cut's not going to be. It's going to be okay. It's not going to be that great. If you cut up and down the lawn, the cut's not going to be that great. The best cut that you're going to get is going to be from cutting diagonally. So if you take like this is my lawn. If you cut, I don't know if I can show it. If you cut like this, like you make passes diagonally up and down the lawn like that way to where you're splitting the difference between going lengthwise and going up and down, that's gonna produce the best cut because you are spreading the weight of the mower over the largest area. If you cut like length, if you cut with it like this, what you're gonna find is the side of the mower that is lower is going to cut shorter than the side of the mower that is on the higher part of the lawn. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna have like this, almost like a, and again, most people aren't gonna see it, but if you're really in your lawn, you'll see it you're gonna have like almost like this terracing effect. You're gonna have like these like terraces that are cut into the lawn versus if you mow it diagonally, it tends to be a smoother a smoother overall cut overall. And that has nothing really to do with the width of the mower. It's more about the way you you cut the lawn, the way you, the, the, the path that you take when you mow the lawn. So, um, so I hope that helps. If you, want, if you don't wanna have a, um, you know, scalping issues in a, um, when you're real mowing, get a front roller, like that's gonna be the, the, be the biggest thing, thing by far. And then after that, the, the cutting technique, the way you mow the lawn, the, the, the pattern you take when you cut the lawn is also gonna have an influence on the quality of cut when you're cutting uneven surfaces. On a flat lawn, doesn't really matter. You can cut, you know, you can have, um, you know, you can cut, a, uh, cut it with a lawn, cut it with a, a, a mower with, with caster wheels if you wanted to. It's still not as good as using a, a roller. But really when you have uneven surfaces, having a roller on the front of the mower um, is the biggest influence of cut quality. And the reason for that, I didn't explain it. I'm kind of going on here a long time on this one, but I want to explain it. So if you think about it, if you have wheels, let's say this is, um, let's say this is a lawnmower, right? It's a terrible example for a lawnmower. But let's say that this is the back of the mower and this is the front of the mower. If you have, like take like my Allet, right? If you have a, a, the rear of the mower being propelled by, repelled by a drum, that's where, that's this part of the mower is gonna stay relatively flat. And if you have a, um, a caster wheel here and a caster wheel here, if I'm mowing a piece of lawn, I'm mowing on the lawn, I'm going, enjoying my, doing myself, having my best life, and I and this part of the lawn, this, this front of the mower goes over a dip. If you have a caster wheel, like the mower, the weight of the mower is supported by three points, one, two, and three. And if we go over a dip here, the mower is gonna be much more likely to, to, to dip that way, which is gonna cause it to scalp. Now, take the same thing, same mower or similar mower where we have a rear drum, but now we have a front roller, right? And we go across the lawn, we have the same area where this section right here is a low spot. Now the weight of the mower is distributed or is distributed over the rear drum and also over this big front roller. So yeah, so while this side of the mower may drop a tiny amount, because the weight is distributed over the entire, over a larger area, like 
uneven surfaces don't matter as much. It's, you're not gonna have cutting issues that you're gonna have versus having like caster wheels on the front of the mower. So again, hopefully, again, I'm gonna explain this well and it makes sense that I, I respectfully disagree. Like having a front roller is the biggest thing, the most important part of getting a great cut with a real mower. And then outside of that, um, when you're cutting slopes or uneven surfaces, the path you take when you cut um, matters a lot. And I'm saying this from direct experience because I got like a, a slope lawn that I mow several times a week and I've mowed it in every different way you can think about. And I can tell you, go, mowing it diagonally produces the best cut overall. So hope that helps. And also for scalping, yeah, same thing. The width of the mower, I mean, you could you could argue that on a lawn, on a on a, a mower that is too wide, on a slope is more likely to scalp when you get to the bottom of the of the slope or the top of the slope than a narrower mower is. So again, it's not the, the width of the mower; it's having a front roller on it. Okay, next up is Ted Rogers. He says, "Good morning, Ron. What's going on, Ted? Hopefully you're doing well. Appreciate you hanging out this morning." And then next is McNasty Motorsports. He says, "Nothing like some lawn talk for my morning motivation." You know, guys, I think it stopped raining. I think I might, well, no, not really, it's still wet. Yeah, I, I was looking outside at the cameras and it's still, it's still mowing. Wishful thinking, I was thinking because I'm getting excited about mowing and that all this talk, I'm sending good vibes to mother nature and she's gonna cooperate. She's like, nope, you shall be denied today, Ron. No mowing for you. All right, uh, next up is Jason Harrison. He says, for the PGR amount question, whatever your rate, 0.38 for 419 times your square footage in thousands, so 0.38, times the 1.356 uh, is your amount. Perfect, great, well well done, um, Jason. And if you're gonna, if you're going to um, spray twice per month, take whatever that number comes out to and divide it in half, and divide it in half. And then you spray it on the 1st and the 15th. Good, nice nice one, Jason, appreciate that. All right, next up is uh, Athan48786 says, hello from Dunwoody, what's going on? Dunwoody, Georgia in the house. What's going on, uh, Athan48786? Uh, he says, or half if you're spraying bi-monthly. So, so, so he, uh, so he, he, he corrected that, or he added that that feature as well. All right, next up is Tad Crazio. I think he says, I'm having sod installed next week, 15,000 square feet. He didn't recommend using any fertilizer before laying the sod, but we agreed a small amount of starter fert post install. What should I do? or not do. I would do whatever the people that are installing the sod are telling you to do. Because a lot, of, in most cases, when they're installing sod, they get, they'll, you know, the guarantee you're gonna get, it's gonna establish and do well. And um, if, if you're dealing with someone that's doing that, a service that's doing that, like they will have a prescription of what they want you to do. They'll be like, you know, don't mow it before this much of the time, make sure you water it this much, F put fertilizer on it, or don't put fertilizer on it, or put this kind of fertilizer on it. So whatever they're telling you to do is what I would do. Um, is what I would do. I would, I would say though, um, as far as the starter fertilizer, like he says, any using any starter fertilizer before laying the side, we agreed on a small amount, but we agreed to a small amount of starter fert. Uh, post, okay, did, did you, you said, because the way you're asking the question, did you agree to a small amount of starter fert um, prior to installing it, or you're saying post install, he said it's okay. Um, I mean, whatever, whatever, they, whatever they want you to do, um, it's is you know again, I would follow their their instructions or guidance because again, they're likely going to be guaranteeing it um, if you do it their way. But if it's if the starter fertilizer that you're going to be using is granular, it makes sense to me, more sense to me that you would apply that prior to the sod going down. The reason for that is this, right? If you think about it, like the sod is already it's already grass, it's already like growing grass, um, and granular fertilizer needs to get into the soil to work. So if you are gonna go and put granular fertilizer on top of the sod after it's installed, like you're, I mean, it still will work, so we do, we do it, you know, monthly anyway, but like if you're talking about getting it to work faster, it would make more sense that you would install, you would, you'd apply it to like the bare dirt, the bare ground, and then apply the sod uh, or lay the sod on top of that. So the way you're asking the question, I'm not sure if that's what you agree to or not, Either way, starter fertilizer is a good idea, and I would just follow whatever the instructions are that the installer is um, is giving you because they're gonna they're again them them guaranteeing the sod is or, or guaranteeing their work is um, often um, based around you doing what they you know you doing what they, what they ask you to do in the way they ask you to do it as far as maintenance goes. All right, next up is um, Bermuda Dave. He says. Hey Ron, I'm thinking about verticutting and adding uh, plant growth regulator. Um, however, I'm shooting myself in the foot. Am I shooting myself in the foot since I'm stressing the lawn and sunning its growth? What steps should I take to do both? So 
Mylon, I'll, I'll answer your question the best way I know how, um, Dave, which is what from a direct experience. Um, if you are verticutting correctly, if you're doing it the way that I recommend, which is to do it not crazy aggressively. In other words, if the if the blades of the verticutter are getting down into the dirt, you're doing it way too aggressively. Um, the most aggressive I would say is that the, you, around two to four millimeters above the surface of the soil is where you want to set up the verticutter. That is going to do a good job of cutting the stolons, of cutting the you know all the runners in your Bermuda grass. Um, without introducing a lot of unnecessary stress. Case in point, this is my lawn 13 days. It was taken Friday. This video was taken Friday. This is 13 days after the lawn was verticut, soil roll, turf raked, and then I applied my um, my essential G and, for, and uh, Humic Max, and I sprayed it, right? So this is literally um, not even two weeks after being verticut and a bunch of other stuff being done to the lawn that you could argue introduces stress. And it looks looks really good, or at least I think it looks pretty good, right? So if you're doing it correctly, where you're not, you know, you're not carving channels, or to where to where your verticutting doesn't essentially become dethatching, you really shouldn't be anything to worry about. Because my lawn has also been under regulation; it's been under growth reg since uh, late April, early May. Since uh, since May, it's been on, under under primo, and I verticut it the end of May, and still 13 days later you saw there how it looks. So it's not, there's not really a concern as far as PGR um, negatively impacting the lawn, assuming, assuming again, you're not going too aggressive, assuming the lawn's in pretty good shape before you verticut it and you don't go too aggressively, it's really not going to be, um, it's not really not going to be a problem. So, um, so I really wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it um, too much. So I would, um, if you can, I would, I would time the verticutting around the, around the time of the month um, when you, which, when you're going to do um, a nutrient input. So prior, like that's why I say I, I do my verticutting at the end of the month. So because after I do that, I do my granular, I'll do my biosimilants, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spray the lawn with liquid fertilizer, all things which will help the lawn recover a bit, fax, a bit faster. Um, he says, uh, Bermuda Dave says, last question, I know you use Primo Max PGR is, uh, pra, uh, Pramaxis, MEC, any different? Um, I don't know if, I'm not familiar with that one. I'm not sure if, it's, if the active ingredient in it is Trinexapac ethyl, um, they have the same active ingredient. Um, talking to Syngenta, the carriers are different. So if you look at, like in other words, what's in Primo, Bala Primo, is not just Trinexapac ethyl, which is the thing that we, is the active ingredient. There are also um, a, bunch of, a bunch of other ingredients that are in there as well. Those ingredients will not be in T, or not be, will not be the same ones that are in TNX, at least not the same ratios anyway, in TNX or in this other uh, product that you're talking about. So, um, so yeah. So they from if if the the active ingredient if it's again if it's, if it's trinexamide ethyl that is the same, but the other parts of what's in the bottle will not be the same. So given the price, given the fact that you can buy now since they did this a bottle of Primo for like forty bucks, you know what I mean? Um, I would just get the name brand stuff. That's what that's what I would do. I switched to this a couple years back, and I have not I have not looked back. So that's what I would I would I would say um, Bermuda Dave. And again, if you are um, as far as your verticutting question, you really shouldn't have any problems as long as you do it. Like I'm saying, don't don't go crazy aggressive with it, um, and time it around the time uh, time it at the end of the month before you are going to do your next granular fert and liquid sprays, assuming you're doing that. All right, next up is Shauna. She's up next. She says, putting my house up for sale. Uh, three years, I've worked on my 5,600 square feet of Bermuda, new construction home, maybe 2,500 square feet or so. So I'm sad I'll be losing so much area to mow, LOL, but I'm gaining irrigation. Yeah, that's true. That's true, Shauna. I mean, congrats. Um, I guess we'll clap it up for you on that. We, we can do that. Congrats on selling the house and also getting a new house and the new lawn, which means, you know, more fun, more things to, to work on. And, and here's the thing I would say this too. You say you're going from 5,000 square feet to 2,500 square feet. There's pros and cons to that. The, the, the pro is that it's going to take less products to take care of 2,500 square feet. You're able to mow it more frequently because it takes less time if you want to do that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, there's, there's benefits to having a smaller lawn, less smaller lawn, less to take care of. There's always a benefit, you know what I mean? So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't poo-poo having a smaller lawn too much. And, and 2,500 square feet is still enough that you, you, got, you got enough to work with that you can make it look really nice. You know what I mean? If you, if you told me you were going to like a 500 square foot lawn I, from 5,000 square feet, I could see that. That might be, you know, hashtag tears in our eyes. But a, um, you know, 2,500 square feet, that's still a lot to work with to, to have a great looking lawn. 
All right, so Ted, uh, Ted Rogers, I guess he says um, 2.5 inches. Is that for for fescue? Is that what you're, tell what you're telling me, um, Ted? If so, I appreciate it. And we got a super chat here from um, Adam Carter. Thank you so much, Adam, I appreciate that. Super chat received. Hopefully my question, okay, he says, he's, uh, he says, I believe what he was saying is that more area is covered with the roller, so it has less chance of dipping and the roller going into the hole and just going over it and not scalping the grass. Um, you're saying if you're having, I mean, I, I, I guess so. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, in other words, it's what you're saying is, yeah, if you have a, if you have a wider mower, if you have a wider mower with a, with a front roller on it, does having a wider roller when you go over a dip um, make it less likely to scalp? Um, yeah, depending on the dip, yes. I guess I, guess I could see that, but I guess, I, I mean, it, it depends. It's, it's such an edge case because if it's a really, if it's a small dip, it doesn't matter. If it's a really, if it's a large, if it's a large enough dip for that to matter, I don't think it's gonna, I, I don't I don't know that it's gonna matter that much, man. I really don't, I don't think so. I think the bigger, like you're really splitting hairs. The thing that matters most is that you have a front roller on your, on your, on your, um, on your, your real mower versus having caster wheels. That's gonna make a bigger difference. And like I said before, like having a wider mower is not always a good thing, especially if you're you're mowing slopes or, un, or un, uneven areas or contours. Like a wider mower is not better in that case. A, 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 um, a narrower mower is. It's easier for you to cut that without without causing scalping problems. A good good example. Like if I mow my, I can show you. I can show you an example of this uh, on video. So if you look at the, my back lawn right here, and I'll pause it and show you. Okay, cool. So if you look in the very, the, the, the end of that, so look to the, to all the way towards the end of my lawn, where you see um, it slopes up, like it, be, it begins to curve up, almost like a little half pipe, a little pool. You see where it curves up there? When I mow the lawn, if I mow it like this, um, with a with my my allet, it's, all, it's happy days, it's fine. It's no problem at all, right? But now when I mow that part of the lawn, that area that curves up, with the same mower and I mow it lengthwise. So in other words, if I'm mowing, I don't have anything that's curved to be able to show you. We will take, we'll take this. We'll take this, this and make it, this is the mower. This is the, my, uh, my lawn. So if I'm mowing with the outlet, which is a wider mower, 27 inches, if I'm mowing up the, the pipe, like up and down, passes like this, no problem. Work, works great, cuts, cuts pretty good. If I mow it lengthwise like this, where what, what I find is right here, like the, the lower part and the higher part, they, those areas get cut lower. They don't necessarily scalp, but they do get cut lower than the middle part. So that's a second. That's an, a situation where having a wider mower is not better. Like that's a section of the lawn. If I break out the true cut, which is 25 inches, and I cut it with that, it does a better job as far as like not or making the cut more even than even the outlet does when I mow it lengthwise. If I mow it like the, you know, like up and down the curve, then it's fine. So. Wider is, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's, there's there's always edge cases where wider is better, narrower is better. Like you can't say there's one best for all situations. The biggest difference, the big, the biggest influence of your mower cutting well, a real mower anyway, is having a front roller though. So that that's what I would um, I would stick with. And again, I haven't seen the video that you're talking about, so I'm not sure the context of what Doc was, was, was saying. Um, but I think of what I'm explaining to you, it makes, that it makes sense. And probably what I'm saying is he would likely agree with it. Um, it's just, you know, remember, you, you're taking what he said and then translating and, and, and telling me. So I'm not sure um, what was what what may or may not have been lost um, in translation. But hopefully my explanation makes sense for you as far as wide versus short or wide versus narrow mowers. All right, uh, let's see here. You have uh, Jerry Espinoza says, how do you calculate water soluble fertilizer? For example, triple 20, I wanna put down quarter pounds per thousand. I have Bermuda. Um, you can look and the label, the label should um, should tell you, uh, Jeremy. For example, I have, I have a couple of um, some water soluble um, fertilizers that I've been I've been sent that have been sent to me for like some testing, some testing stuff I'm doing. Um, and in all of them, they have in those cases is they they tell you it's by weight. So they'll say um, this many ounces of this product gives you, will put out this amount of nitrogen. So the product you're using, um, should have 
um, a rate chart on it. It should say this many, if it's a, if it's a dry product that you, mix with, that you mix with water, it should say this amount of dry product um, with um, this, amount of, this, this amount of dry product by weight um, with a gallon of water, that, that will put, it, put out this amount of N. Actually, the amount of water doesn't really matter, but this amount of, of product of by weight produces uh, this amount of N. So I would say just check check the label because any water soluble fertilizer is going to um, is going to have that. All right, uh, Ted says yeah. So tall fescue, two inches to four point five inches. Okay, so yeah, so cut tall fescue, whatever the range is on the shorter ends of the range. Um, whenever you're going to do top dressing, it will make your life easier. All right, Tad Crazio is up next. He says following up. Um, I guess based on a recent question, he says, I'm in the Atlanta area. I can't seem to find anyone who does lawn leveling. Oh, there's a couple of people, man. There's a couple of folks that'll do it. There is, um, I'll, I'll give you some names here. So I would love to level my Bermuda, but know anyone in Atlanta that does it. Yes. So there's two companies that I'm aware of in the Atlanta area. There is, um, there's level lawns and there is Sandman. Sandman has leveled my lawn a couple of times. They do a pretty good job. Um, level lawns, I don't have any direct experience with, um, but I think they're, I mean, they've been, they've been in business for a long time. So if you're bad at like leveling, you tend to not stay in business. So look between those two, get close between those two. Depending on where you are in the Atlanta area, they, you know, there might, there's likely gonna be a price difference. Um, but level lawns or Sandman. Sandman Top Dressing, the owner of Sandman Top Dressing is Richard, a guy named Richard. Um, know him pretty well. So either Sandman or Level Lawns. If you look for those two, those those are two services that I know of in Atlanta that do it. And there's probably some smaller mom and pop services that will do leveling work as well. I mean, if you're in Atlanta, uh, there's, there's yeah, you, if you don't want to top dress your lawn, you can absolutely get, you can absolutely pay uh, someone to do it. That is, uh, that is definitely uh, a thing. It's definitely uh, a thing around here. We are, we are spoiled that way. Really easy to find real mowers, really easy to find places to work on real mowers, and easy to find places to get sand, to get top dressing done. Look, we are, we are spoiled in, in Atlanta. All right, next up is uh, the Mant, uh, the Mantiques, uh, the Mantiques um, Cave says, uh, hey, Ron from Forsyth County. Yesterday I had my yard Bermuda top dressed and leveled. Unfortunately, the vendor used a mix loaded with junk. I assume there isn't anything I can do but let the grass grow. Yeah, so here, there are some things you can do. So there you go um, for, for who was the comment before you? For Tad, there's someone that had someone just level their lawn. So there's there's services that'll do it. So if you're if it's the stuff I'm thinking about, there are some services that will do top dressing and they use peanut shells in the top dressing, which I absolutely hate because it makes such a big mess. And it, they, they take a long time to break down and it makes a mess. Um, so what you can do, Mantique's Cave, is go out and buy yourself a leveling rake. And if you take that leveling rake and you just drag it, so you have to do some work to, to, to fix this, but you can you can get the debris and peanut shells and garbage out of the lawn, out of your out of your lawn. You just take the leveling rake and just, just lay it down and you can just walk, just walk and just drag it behind you. So I think I've got a video showing the technique, the technique for doing that. But you're not you're not going to be like working it. Let me get on this bigger wider camera. You're not going to be putting the leveling rake down and working the material in because that's already done. They already did that for you. You're just going to be laying, literally laying it down on the on your lawn and just and just dragging it. And what you're going to find is the lighter material, the lighter debris, like little twigs and stones. Well, uh, little stones, twigs, um, uh, peanut shells, bark, anything like that is going to get caught in the rate, in the grates. It's gonna get caught in between the grates. So when you get to the end of a pass, you're gonna have a lot of like light, um, you're gonna have a lot of, a lot of um, like surface garbage or debris that you can just, you can pick up, throw in a bucket and then do the same thing going back in the other direction. That is, a, I mean, I'm saying an easy way, but that is the best way that I know to remove debris out of your, um, out of your lawn after, after top dressing. If you use a service that, that makes a bit of a mess. So if you look at this video, where is it? I have a video from a couple years ago on this, on the topic of what should you do after your lawn is top dressing. Like you just finished top dressing your lawn, now what? How can, what are some things you can do to speed up recovery? What are some things you should do with some things you should not do? And that is in this video, the Mantiques, this video here. 
uh, that one. So watch that. Um, but again, one of the things you're going to see in there is getting a leveling rake and just dragging. Like again, you're not you are not trying to move the material around. You're literally just letting the, the weight of the rake do the work as you drag it along the along the lawn. Any small pebbles or twigs or bark or peanut shells will get will get stuck in the grates, um, in between the grates. And when you get to the end of a pass, you can scoop them up, throw them in a five gallon bucket, and that's a way to clean up the, the trash in your lawn. And it's also a way to help your lawn recover faster. So that's something you should be doing anyway. If you do that every every day, um, again, just you're not you shouldn't really break a sweat doing this because all you're doing is just walking your lawn. If you do that every day, it's going to to make your lawn recover faster as well. So hope that helps uh, the Mantiques. Uh, sorry you got a top dressing with a lot of debris in it, but there are ways around it. All right, uh, Ted Rogers says, uh, Tony, I swear my, all my friends are making fun of me as well. All I ever want to talk about is lawn work. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're never, if you're talking about lawn work and your neighbors and friends are not into it, I could see that. Robert Rainey's in the house. Says, morning, everyone. What's going on, Robert? Um, Ted Rogers says, I feel dumb. Where's the like button? The like button is, okay. So if, you, if you're if you on YouTube, you'll see like the, um, I'm looking here. You'll see a, you'll see the title of this live stream where it says, I got rained out, so let's talk lawn care. You'll see the up, you'll see the thumbs up. You'll see the thumbs up and thumbs down button. Um, you can hit the thumbs up button, that is a like. If you hit the thumbs down button, it is a dislike. Both of them help interaction. I prefer likes over dislikes, but I mean, any, you know, I, I'll take what I can get, you know? I mean, there's people that come in my live stream every single week just to dislike it, which is fine because you're still giving me interaction, so I appreciate you. I appreciate even the haters, right? All right, next up is Robert uh, Gunby. He says, what is the best Bermuda grass seed to plant in Georgia? I have about three and a half acres to plant currently that has a lot of Bahia grass with some coastal Bermuda mixed in. Uh, so the grass seeds that I have direct experience with, unfortunately, you can't get anymore, Robert. So I would tell you normally like Princess 77 or Arden 15, the grass seed that a lot of people seem to be liking and using these days are, um, are Monaco and Yukon. Monaco and Yukon are ones that I'm hearing a lot about and people seem to be liking those. So if you look up, uh, if you go to, I think Hancock Seed sells them. There are, there are a couple other places that sell it too, but if you check, up, check out Hancock Seed, I think they're in like Lakeland, Florida. They, that is where I've gotten my grass seed in the past when I was getting it. And um, you know you can look there for other, for other options. I will tell you three and a half acres is no joke to try and get that to grow from grass seed. I, you know, as far as irrigation, unless you got like a pond or something, I'm not sure how you're going to to water it because that's going to be a big and that's going to be important part of the Bermuda grass um, establishing properly. So, just, just some things to consider. So, if you go, on, if you're going to go out there and you're going to, you know, spend all this money, which is going to be three and a half acres, going to be thousands of dollars in grass seed. I would want to. I'd also ensure that you have a way to water it because you're not going to get great germination unless you water. You know, you really can't allow the grass seed to dry out once you um once you plant it, once you sow it. So that's just a consideration to make. Um on the topic of grass seed, um I mean, if you're interested, there is a a blog post we released on Friday on this topic. So if you go to guides and then go to blog on the Golf Horse Lawn Store, our newest ones are what are the best types of grass seed and um, and how long do they take to grow? And we talk about um, KBG, we talk about Bermuda grass, we talk about perennial rye grass, we talk about St. Augustine, for which, again, trick question, there is no grass seed. Um, but because I get asked it a bunch of times anyway, I just have this, I have a section in here talking about St. Augustine grass saying, hey, you really can't grow St. Augustine from grass seed, you got to use plugs or sod. Um, but yeah, the, the, it just talks about the different about growth rates and all this kind of stuff. So if you're interested in that, Robert, I will send that this blog post to you here in the chat. But the long short of it is um, Yukon or Monaco, if you're going to be going, if you're going to be doing it from seed is what I would say to look into. And um, before you do that, make sure you have a way to, to water it or, you know, irrigate it. Or here's what's going to happen. If you don't have irrigation, um, which again, three and a half acres is pretty hard to irrigate, what I, if you want to give it a go anyway, what I would say is if you can look at the forecast when there's going to be, you know, a week of rainfall, um, you know, you could plan to do your seeding like just prior to that and just see how much germination you get out of like, you know, Mother Nature just watering it and seeing, you know, seeing what you get from that. But it's, you know, it, it would really be better if you had a way to water it. But I know three and a half acres, that's, um, that is, uh, is, is tough to do. 
Uh, but yeah, this blog post on different grass, seed, grass types and grass seed and their germination rates and what to expect, you might find useful. Sounds like a fun project. Keep me posted on how it goes. All right, Lavendi says, on Sunday, okay, I see you. And glad you're still staying positive with the rain. Yeah, man, I mean, I couldn't, couldn't mow, so I still can't mow, so I'm gonna, you know, be out here and live stream, why not? If I can't do some fun stuff in the lawn, why not try and help some folks out, right, on a Sunday? Jimmy Miller says, happy Sunday. Any suggestions on finding a Toro Greens Master? There are almost none online right now. Uh, you can check. So if you're on Facebook, there are real mowing groups or groups on um, on Facebook where you can where people will be selling real mowers, will be selling, selling sometimes a Greens Master. You can check Craigslist. You can check um, offer up there's the i'm not sure if the weeks auction is still a thing or if, but there i know people that have gotten greens masters from there if you're in the atlanta area you can call jerry pate company they are the toro dealer in the atlanta area for greens mowers they often get mowers off lease from golf courses and that they will they will um service and they'll make them available for sale so you can look at that for an option for getting a greens mower um there's a company called Prairie Turf and Irrigation, I think, out of Manitoba, Canada. That is where I got my greens mower many moons ago. Um, and it was a, it's, I mean, it's gonna be more expensive to go that route because you're gonna be paying for shipping. Like if you're having it trucked from Canada to, uh, to wherever you happen to be in the country. But it, I got a very nice unit from them. So actually, let's look here. Like we can go over to Prairie Turf and Irrigation. So we go there. These guys are out of Manitoba. I think the guy's name is Greg that runs the shop. So you got a couple of Jacobsons and you've got a greens mower, Toro Flex, here we go. So you got uh, a 2004 to 2007, 21 inch uh, Flex. So uh, yeah, so it tells you what the engine's in it. They're gonna have it serviced and sharpened, set up, ready to mow, great condition. And uh, and yeah, so I, I would reach out to them because then they sometimes will have mowers they don't have listed on their website that are available for sale. So I would just give them a call. Again, this is this route is gonna be a little bit more expensive because you're paying to ship it to you, but you can find a really clean mower, a nice mower uh, going doing, you know, this way. For example, my mower is a 2013, I think it's a 2013, 2013 and 2014, I think it's a 2013. And I got it with 196 hours on it, just under 200 hours and it was like $3,500, which for, if you know anything about greens mowers, like, under two hundred hours on a greens mower is like practically brand new. It's almost a, you know didn't get run at all. Um, so it's so you can get some really high quality units from them. Um, so just call them and see what they've got available, and um, and then that will um, you know that that might be another option for you as well, Jimmy. And so there you go. There is um, their your website. I just linked it to you in the chat. Give them a call. And again, I got my mower from them, and I I like it. It runs it runz well. Next up is Doug, 350Z. He says, aeration is great for foot traffic. That's why golf courses do a lot of aeration. That's another good point. Yeah, so aeration is something else you can do as well. Um, Matthew from um, from the Netherlands. I, I didn't think about it from that standpoint. I thought about, I thought thought he was asking from a standpoint of like, my, my grass is matted down. What can I do to let it not be matted down? But yeah, if, it's, if the question was around compaction, then yes, I agree with you. Aeration is a good thing. Like real aeration, like you know, the hollow time, core aeration, mechanical aeration, not this, uh, not this um, aeration in a bottle stuff. Next up is Lance F. He says, "I woke up this morning and I must have gone back in time. It's Friday night. I like this. <laughs> Lol. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, man. It ra I got rained out, man. So Lance, I figure why not, why not hang out here and uh, chat with you guys for a little while. I'm not sure how long I've been streaming. An hour, two. So two hours already. Good lord. I talk a lot." Gift, the gift of gab, right? All right, so we have a question here from Noah Bigman um, about real mowers. It says, can you cut an uneven lawn with a real mower and not scalp it up? Depends on how uneven it is. Uh, generally, yes. Generally, yes. Um, you're just gonna have to have, you have to raise the cutting height um, of the mower to prevent, to prevent scalping. And I'll put you this way. If you are, if you're cutting a lawn at one inch, right, which is a good height for a real mower, you are much less likely to scalp one uh, a lawn cutting it at one inch using a real mower um, than you are with a rotary mower. So if a rotary mower is scalping your lawn at one inch, a real mower is less likely to scalp your lawn at one inch if you have a front roller on it. So it, it the answer is it depends. Um, you can cut an uneven lawn 
with a real mower. It doesn't have, you don't have to top dress before you, um, you, you, uh, you use a real mower on it. A good example, like my lawn was, I real mowed my lawn with a push real mower for like a year and a half before it was even top dressed the first time, right? And, um, and it was, it was just fine. You know what I mean? So it's, you so see, you absolutely can cut a lawn with that's not been leveled with a real mower. You're just going to have to be a little more cognizant of how low you set the cutting heights. If you want to cut really short, you know, three quarters of an inch, shorter, half an inch, like want to get really low. That's when having, uh, the lawn being top or so having it being, ha not having any, any harsh bumps in the lawn is, uh, it becomes important. You can have bumps, you can have like rolling bumps or, you know, you can have like, you know, like smoothed out bumps, like rolling ones, that's okay. But what you can't have is like big dips or like harsh rises because that's when you start having um, cutting problems or scalping problems. All right, hope that helps. Uh, Nola, appreciate the question on uh, on the real mower, on cutting. And let me see guys, we're almost out, we're almost out. We're almost done here, guys. Almost about to wrap it up. Randy Velarde is up next. He says, hello Ron, thank you for your expertise. What's your go-to on greening up your Bermuda? I would say fertilize it based on your soil test results. So and on my lawn, I can tell you what I do. I apply a granular fertilizer, Humic Max on the first of the month, and then I also spray a liquid um, combination of biostimulants and fertilizer also on the 1st and the 15th, and then I mow it a lot. So outside of the, the inputs, mowing is a, a with a sharp mower, uh, you know, with good with, with well-maintained equipment is an important tool of having a great looking lawn. You want, if you wanna have a lawn that's green and stays green between mowings, mowing is really important. That's a, that's a, big, a big part of it. So that's what I would say. Um, fertilize according to uh, your soil test results and then mow, mow, and mow some more. That's how you get a great looking lawn. Uh, Thomas Hanan says, uh, says, how do you store all your liquid products? Garage, indoors, all in plastic containers together? Um, do the outside temps affect the liquid products? Uh, so are they all are in the garage. Um, outside of the stuff that I have here as like props around the show, right? So the like stuff that's here on the show, um, like this stuff that you see here, like this Primo, this Acelaprin, you know, this surfactant, like these are all liquid products and they're on my desk, but these are all brand new and unopened, right? So they're unopened, they're sealed. I don't worry about spilling or anything like that. Any of the stuff that I'm actually using on the lawn is stays in the garage. As far as in a plastic container, nope, I don't keep it in a plastic container. My garage is insulated and that's been enough for me. You know, we get, our winters here in Georgia are not crazy, um, not crazy cold for extended periods of time. And our summers, while they get hot, are not, you know, are not, they're not, you know, like Arizona or anything like that. So just keeping them, keeping the containers sealed, like keeping them, like to the, keep the caps on there nice and tight and then keeping them in a garage. I've had great results uh, with that, Thomas. I mean, if you are trying to be really cautious, like if you say at the end of the season, like throughout the season, I wouldn't do any of this, but at the end of the season, let's say you have like your fungicides or you have like um, a product like Celsius or something, right? Again, if the cap is on and it's tight, you really shouldn't have a problem. But if you're trying to um, to preserve it, you can um, take you can make sure the caps on nice and tight, and you can put it in a in a like a, a ziploc bag, a sealed ziploc bag, like get all the air out of it, and you can put that on it. That's like another another step you can do to keep moisture out of like um, out of like granule or water soluble products. But for the liquids, I just just leave them in the garage. You know, I just leave them in the garage. That's uh, that's what I do. I don't keep them indoors because there's no need to. All right, so hope that helps, Thomas. Next up is Jim Carson. Jim says, hello everyone, what's going on, Jim? I appreciate you from hanging out. And uh, next up is Bermuda Dave. He says, thanks for the great explanation on the front roller versus caster wheels. Why don't they make more rotary mowers with front and back rollers? I see Toro's stripe mower, but it doesn't have a front roller. Uh, mainly cost. There are front, there are mowers, there are rotary mowers that have um, front rollers on them. There are, like Toro makes one. I forget what it's called. It's, it's a, the, the stripe, uh, I don't forget. Toro does make a mower that does that. There is a mower that does that and Allet makes one as well. Let me find it here. Like, yeah, here we go. So like this one is a Bermuda Dave. If you go to Allet and you go to their Sports Pro mower, so this is the commercial mowers, uh, like they have the Uplift. Like the Uplift is a, um, a rotary mower that has, um, you know, it's got it's got um, front wheels like um like like what you see here, but you can also there are also options for rollers that that will in other words this this mower will stripe, is what I'm is what I'm getting at, um, and the other one they have to make an evolution version of this, 
that will, nope, that's the wrong thing. That will also stripe. Um, where is it? Like this guy here. Yeah. So like that guy, like the evolution version of it, um, it's got a brush here, which will help, you know, which will also help comb the grass or roll the grass down in, um, in a direction. And this guy on the back, the back of it, see there's a shot of the back of it. It's got a big old roller. Oh, come on. Come on. Show me a picture of the back. A picture of the back of it. It's just propelled by a big rare drum. Of course, I'm not seeing it. Um, yeah, well, this one, in other words, this is a rotary mower that will stripe. And if you want to see pictures of it, of it, a video of it running, you can go on, you can kind of make it out here in this one, in this picture here. But yeah, it's propelled by a big, by a big rear drum. So, so yeah, so this guy and the, um, the uplift, I think will also, I think the uplift is also uh, propelled by a rear, um, I think it's also a rear drum propelled as well. They don't show the back of it here. Yeah, they do. Yeah, see, so the back of it, that's a good shot right there. So this guy's got a big roller in the back. This one stripes stripes as well. So um, the big thing is cost, uh, Bermuda Dave. It's um, like these, as you see, the price tag on these mowers are like fifteen, they're like five figure mowers. Toro's mower that does this is not that expensive. It's over, it's over a thousand dollars, but I think you can get it between a thousand and two thousand. Um, it's not so. It's not like allet prices. It's not crazy, super crazy expensive. Um, but it's mainly it's mainly a price thing. And if you think about it, uh, it's also a limited. From a marketing perspective, it's a limited um, limited audience, kind of a niche audience, right? Like most people that have rotary mowers, like they don't um, they don't care about stripes, and they're not gonna they're not going to to pay a bunch of money for a mower that just produces better stripes. Like the people that care about that are people that like watch lawn care live streams on a Sunday morning, right? It's a it's a smaller it's a smaller um, market for that, so it's a cost thing, and then they're not going to sell that many of them. And the people that are really serious about getting stripes in their lawn. Of it, they level their lawns and they go out and they buy real mowers. So there is that. Okay, next up is uh, Martin D. Martin D. He says, what is your favorite variety of Bermuda grass? Uh, these days, Tahoma looks really pretty. I mean, I like I like what I have. I like my Arden 15, my, my, my Mutt Lawn, Arden 15 Tifway blend. Um, but Tahoma 31 is very pretty. It's a very nice looking grass. Um, which is, what are your thoughts on Tiff Tough? Tiff Tough is also nice. Uh, I, I believe the real... The Real Rollers Turf Park, if you ever go get a chance to visit uh, Lee and the, the crew there at Real Rollers, the, if you're standing, the, the, the Bermuda grass plaques, they have two zoysias and one Bermuda. The one that is Bermuda is Tiff Tough. And it looks great. The color looks great on it. Is I was considering putting down some Tiff Tough sod in my backyard in the Atlanta area. Don't have irrigation. Yeah, Tiff Tough is a good, is a great uh, grass as well. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. So Tiff Tough, um, Tahoma 31, if I were doing a renovation, like if we're going to go do Bermuda from scratch now, Alon, I would likely do uh, Tahoma. I would do Tahoma over um, Tiff Tough because I like the way it looks. But Tiff Tough is a great looking grass too. It's Bermuda. They all look nice. Uh, and you have irrigation. Yeah, so you're, you're a perfect example of why doing it by, by a sod is a good idea. You're still going to have to figure out a way to water it though. So you have to drag a hose out there and, you know, move the hose around, move the sprinkler head around to get, to get some water on it so that it does, um, it doesn't dry out. Uh, next up is um, the unknown mister. Is scarifying good after a dethatching? I'm not sure why you would really need to. I mean, after dethat, I mean, if you're doing dethatching, that's pretty aggressive. Um, if you're just if you're setting up a scarifier just to do some cleanup work, in other words, if you're just going to turf rake after you dethatch to get debris off the lawn, that would be okay. But I mean, dethatching is far more aggressive than. Um, uh, than, than turf raking slash scarifying is. So, uh, so yeah. Um, let's see here. Next up, we have a question here on Instagram from Nola. She said, I'm interested, or Nola, or, or him, him on Instagram. He says, I'm interested in PGR, but I've never used it. Which one do you recommend? So the, the one that I use and recommend is called Primo Max. This is like the name brand product from Syngenta. So uh, yeah, so this is what I would use. And to help you out with that, Nola, um, I've also got a blog post that talks all about growth regulator that I will link here for you in the chat. Um, and that's, I would say read that as well too. So it's a really short read. It'll take you all of five minutes to read it. Um, and it talks all about growth regulator. What are the benefits? What are some tips and tricks to get a good result whenever you apply it? And it does mention Primo Max in 
uh, that blog post as well. But yeah, this is um, this is what I would go with, Primo Max. Big benefit of this also is that you have a measuring cup built into it. So whenever you read the label and you get the application rate for your particular grass type, it's super easy to measure it because there's a measuring cup built right into the bottle, right? So which is also nice. All right, so next we have Alfredo Martinez. He says, Bermuda grass, during different seasons, what height slash inches shall my grass get to? I maintain the same height of cut over the entire season. I don't change it. So you will see people that will say, you know, whenever in the, um, when as summer, high, as summer comes in, like this time of year when it gets warmer, you should let Bermuda grass get longer. I, I don't, I agree with that in, in one situation. If you are not willing to pick up your, to increase your mowing frequency, then letting it get longer is going to allow your lawn to stay green between mowings. If you think about it, right? Whenever you mow your lawn, there's the one third or one quarter rule or whatever which rule you wanna, you, wanna, um, you wanna stick with. But the idea is whenever you mow your lawn, you wanna cut it frequently enough that you're only cutting off the, the green portion, right? Just, just, the, um, just the, the tips of the grass. Ideally, no more than a third the length of grass. So if you are mowing your lawn, let's say once per week, right? So you're one of these people that you're not really, you're not really on the program yet. You're out there, you're just mowing your lawn once a week. You can get away with once a week mowing in March, in April, maybe even through, I mean, the first part of May, maybe. Um, but once you start getting into June and July, once per week mowing, whenever you mow your, when you cut your grass, what you're gonna see is it's going to have areas that are gonna be brown because you're gonna be cutting off too much material, too much grass, too much leaf in a single, a single, um, um, session, right? There's too much space between mowings. So if you're someone that's not willing to mow more during the summer months, then letting your grass get a little taller is good advice because then it'll allow your lawn to stay green between mowings. If you are someone like me or someone that's really in your lawn and you want it to look nice year round, you can maintain the same height of cut all the way, all the, throughout the year. But what that means is whenever you get in the summer months when the grass is growing more frequently, you have to mow more frequently. So whereas Again, if you're real mowing in the spring, you're cutting it twice a week. In the summer, you'll be cutting it, you know, three times a week. At some, it, depending on your cutting height, if you're cutting it, let's say half an inch or, or cutting it five eighths or so or on half an inch, you could be mowing every other day. If you're cutting it under half an inch, you'll be mowing every day at certain points of the year. So it really depends on you, Alfredo. If you if you have the time to get out and mow more frequently, as the summer, as the temperatures get hotter, you can maintain the exact same height of cut throughout the throughout all throughout you know season long. You don't have to change it. It's not like Bermuda is saying, "Oh, it's getting hotter now, so I must grow longer." It doesn't. It doesn't know. It really doesn't care. Um, it's more that is as temperatures get warmer, then the grass starts to grow faster, and to keep it green between mowings, which is what we're after, right? To keep it long green and looking nice between mowings, you have to increase your mowing frequency. So if you don't do that let your grass get longer. If you are gonna do that, then you can maintain the same height of cut, but just pick up your mowing frequency and then you will have a lawn that looks like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna brag on you again here, Robert. I'm gonna show you off again. You can have a lawn that looks like that, right? Which is cut at around five eighths and is, you know, looks awesome. But this lawn is not mowed once a week. It's mowed every couple of days. So that's what it takes. And he can, and the thing is, he can maintain that height of cut throughout the entire season. He can, he could, he could have started that in like March, and he can cut it that height now through July, through August, through September. He can leave it that height of cut the, the entire time, you know, as if he wants to. There's no, um, he's no need to have to raise the height of cut up um, as long as he's willing to put in the time mowing. So hopefully that my explanation makes sense, Alfredo. And uh, if you have any of your questions, let me know. All right, Dre Nose Kicks says, my soil is extremely compacted. I can barely get a shovel into it. I was wondering how often I can aerate to relieve the compaction, thanks. You know, you, well, you want the lawn to recover between aeration sessions. So what I would say is if you can time your, your next time you aerate around um, some rainfall, if you don't have irrigation, so if you can, you can irrigate the day after it rains, or if you can water your lawn the day before it rains, that is gonna help the, the tines penetrate deeper into the soil. It's gonna help you get a better result. And whenever you aerate, you don't only have to go in one direction. You can you can literally aerate, you can make a pass. Like say again, we'll, we'll bring up our, our fantasy lawn here. So say this is your lawn, you could just aerate back and forth like this and call it good, or you could aerate this way, and then, because you're glutton for punishment, you go back this way. So you can you could really beat the lawn up and and really do a, you know, really get out there and, and um and, and aerate in multiple directions, and that is going to help you relieve the compaction. In other words, if you do it right, like one 
good, a, a good, you should see a big difference, is what I'm trying to say, in the amount of compaction in your lawn from just aerating it one time, if you do it properly, if you, and if, and if it's also prepared properly. So if you ensure the soil is reasonably soft, I mean, you don't want it like, like soaking wet, but if, as long as the, the ground is a little bit soft to where the tines can penetrate and you make passes in multiple directions, that really should be all you need to do, you know, to, to relieve compaction and get the lawn looking a lot better. If you want a tip for how I do it, um, I'll show, and that'll, that's gonna save you time and also save your back. If you go to the golf course lawn store, go to the guides and then blogs, and then you go to page two, which you're not gonna have to do because I'm gonna link it to you in the chat. This um, uh, blog post on how to core aerate your lawn um, in this video shows a technique that I like to use for aeration, which has you like doing overlapping ovals, which means you never have to like make a pass, stop, turn around, make a pass the other way. You're literally able to keep the aerator just moving the entire time. And it does a pretty good job as far as, um, you know, because you're able to overlap the passes, you're able to do a really good job um, aerating the lawn without, with, with less work on your part. So. I will um, send you a link to this uh, Dre Nose Kicks, and hopefully this will help you out as far as irritating your lawn and getting a good result. Next up is Mr. the Mr. Unknown says, my lawn is uneven and I don't scalp with my real mower, but scalps big time with a rotary. Yep, for the same reasons that I likely, like I was saying earlier, you know, real mowers are, believe it or not, are more, at the same cutting heights, I need to caveat that, at the same cutting heights, real mowers are more forgiving from a scalp, or, or better from a scalping perspective than rotaries are. Especially if they have a, if they have a front row roller on them, a real mower at the same cut, cutting height as a rotary is going to scalp less, for the reasons that I explained earlier about the weight distribution. Like, you have the weight spread out over this big front roller, so as far as the, the mower wanting to dip and cut one area lower than another, it's less pronounced, less likely to happen with a real mower than a rotary. Also, you figure out the, the, the cutting area of a of a real mower is like, you know, you've got the reel and bed knife, you've got a cutting area that's like this wide. And if you take like a greens mower where like, the, for a better term, like the wheelbase of the mower, the distance between the front roller and the rear roller is tends to be a bit more narrow. Um, like those tend to do less, those that also helps you prevent scalping compared to a rotary where you've got like, see like a 25, a 20 inch or 21 inch rotary mower. You got this 21 inch cutting disc, right? So if any one of the four wheels of the mower dips, you, you got, it's not like, it's not like a, um, a real mower where you have just like a small section that's gonna like, they might like scalp an area. You're tilting the entire disc. The entire disc is gonna get in there and, and, and take a big chunk out. So just in general, at this, at the same cutting heights, rotaries are going to scalp. Are we going to be more? I'm going to scalp, but they're going to be more prone to scalping than a real mower at the same cutting heights, assuming that real mower has a front roller. So I'm, I, I'm not surprised, Mister um, Unknown, that um, you don't scalp as much with your real mower, but you scalp much uh, as much, a lot more with your rotary for the reasons that I'm explaining. All right, Sundria T says, hi, Ron. Wow, you're live on Sunday. Thanks, that's cool. Yeah, man, tried to change it up. I couldn't, you know, couldn't get out and live stream in the front lawn or in the back lawn while I was going to mow because uh, rain happens. And uh, so I figured why not talk, chat with you guys. He says, here's my question. Why does my lawn have yellow burnt pieces at the top of my grass, the tips of your grass? Could be a lot of reasons. Could be not getting enough water. Um, it likely, it could be, if it's, if the tips of the grass are yellow, it could be, um, the mower isn't sharp. Like that's a reason that that will cause yellowing at the tips. So, you know, that's a, that's a good, a good segue to a talking point here. You know, I talk about mowing and mowing, mowing and mow some more. And if you ever are ever weren't wondering if you should be mowing, you should probably be out mowing. All that is predicated on you keeping your equipment sharp. If you're, if you're out there mowing a bunch with a dull mower, like a dull, with a rotary with dull blades or with a real mower that isn't set up properly, um, the lawn's not gonna look great too. I mean, the, the cut will look even, but the color of the lawn is not gonna look good. You can get, um, like like what, what Sandria's talking about, you can get like yellowing of the tips of the grass. You can, it'll be, um, you can, it'll be more jagged, more jagged edges. In general, um, cutting your lawn with 
dull equipment, with non-sharp equipment, um, is from an appearance standpoint, doesn't look good, but also from a standpoint of increasing the chances you're gonna have disease problems, that goes also goes up whenever you cut the lawn with um, with a mower that's not sharp. So what I would say, Sandria, get down, like pick up pick your grass, take a look at the tips of it and see if they're, you know, if the edges are jagged. Um, if there's, you know, if it look, if, if you're using a real mower, particularly you'll see this with a real mower that is um, that is not set up properly, like the real to bed bar um, clearance isn't set properly. What you'll find is the, the the tips of the grass blades will be pinched. So it'll start like it's trying to cut it, but then it'll get pinched into like um into like a tip, into like a like a like a tip. You know what I mean? It'll get instead of being cut, it'll be pinched and, and pull and and elongated. That's uh, a good. That's a sign that you need to check the the the, the tolerance, the clearance between the real um, and the bed knife, and you want to fix that before you're out there mowing your lawn. Otherwise, it's not going to look good. I mean, there's other reasons that could cause yellowing too. If you overapplied fertilizer, that can cause yellowing. If you overapplied growth regulator, that can cause yellowing. But I'm, you know, I'm assuming you're not doing those things. If it's starting, if it's something that started happening that was not happening before, then check your mower, make sure that it is sharp because that really matters as far as um, cutting, as far as cut quality. As far as cut quality. Uh, Doug says, uh, it's like church for lawn care nerds. Pastor Ron is preaching and Super Chat is a collection plate. There you go. Yeah. If you guys want to pass the collection plate, I always would appreciate it. But I mean, just you, guys, just you guys coming to hang out, taking some of your Sunday morning to hang out with me and talk about lawn care is uh, is often thanks enough. So I really appreciate you guys uh, hanging out. All right. Quincy Williams is up next. He says, uh, hi, Ron. Thanks for the Sunday morning live chat. You're very welcome. Thank you for showing up. And it says... Uh, Correction, why does my grass have yellow pieces at the top of my grass? Does that indicate the grass was burnt? It could be, it could be drought. It could be like, you know, it's not getting enough water or, and it could be a cutting problem. It could be a lot of things. It could be fertilizer burn. It could be a cutting problem. It could be uh, not enough water. It could be a lot of those things. If it's something that, um, if it's something that's, that's relatively new, you, it could be moisture, right? It could be you, you need to increase your water that you're putting on the lawn. If it, it could also be that your your equipment isn't sharp. You know what I mean? Like that. In other words, nothing will make a lawn go from looking really good um, to like not good in like a single mowing than like dull equipment. Like if you go out and you, if I if I go cut my lawn with um with my real with a real mower, if I go and I if I increase the tolerance between the real the bed bar um and real and go cut the lawn with it. A day later, it doesn't look good. It looks, it literally, the, it still looks smooth, but the color will be, it's gonna look like like dull and, and hazy looking. So it, it really is that important. It's really that important that your equipment is sharp to, um, you know, before you go out and, and, and cut with it. I mean, it's part of the reason why golf courses have full-time mechanics that, that their entire job, in addition to keeping the equipment running, is to ensure that whatever goes out on the course is sharp because golf courses can't have uh, the turf getting um, getting injured, you know, as much stress as that, that, that kind of turf goes through, it's got to be cut with sharp, equi sharp equipment. All right. Uh, let's see here. Mr. Nolan says you could also drop a, a desiccant in the bottle. Um, sure. I guess you, I guess you could do, I guess you could do that. Um, what are you talking about? Like for, I guess for, for dry, for dry products is what you're referring to, right? All right. Next up is Jonathan Daza. He says, Hey Ron, whenever you're spoon feeding, um, with FERT, humic, um, humic max, biostimulants, et cetera. How long can I wait until I water it in? I'm hoping for some rain tomorrow and I can put the product down today. Thank you. A day afterwards is no problem. As a matter of fact, because I get this question so much, I did a YouTube short on this very topic, meaning it was on the, on the topic of um, what order, the name of the, of the short is on what, what sequence or what order to apply lawn care products, but it applies to this. The um, the long short of it is the way that I do it, Jonathan, is I will apply Essential G first, Humic Max next, and then I'll go spray my liquids. The the granular, the fertilizer, Humic Max, doesn't get watered in until the unless it rains that evening or until the following day. So if you wait 24 hours to water it in, it's going to be just fine. Um, what you don't want to do is put down granulars and then um, put on granulars and then spray liquids right afterwards. And then right after you're done spraying liquids, if they are foliar based liquids, which all the stuff that you talk about are foliar based, um, or are designed for foliar uptake, go run irrigation right after that. You would not want to do that. But if you wait a day, that will be fine. And there's it. There it is. Get shareable link. Okay. So this guy, this video here, this short Jonathan, it'll only take 60 seconds of your time. 
will explain literally the order that I apply products in and when irrigation is run. So hope that helps. Uh, next up is Lavendi. He says, it's 90s all week. Um, am I safe to apply sedge hammer in North Florida in St. Augustine turf? I, you know, I have to look, I don't know the, on the label for, for sedge hammer. I don't, I don't know if there's, um, I don't know if there's a temperature restriction for sedge hammer. Thing is in the nineties, you want to be careful when you're spraying anything. I mean, you know, you want, I mean, even like Celsius uncertainty, can you spray those when it's 90 degrees out? Yes. Um, you just got to, if you're, if you're using surfactant with them, you may get a, a, a small amount of light yellowing, a small amount of light discoloration. Um, but it's not going to be as bad as if you spray like dismiss or speed zone in 90 degree temps. Like those are going to, are going to, do a number on your lawn if you spray it in those kind of, in those kind of temps. I don't know off the top of my head for sedge hammer as far if this is a temperature restriction, but again, in the anything you're spraying in the 90s, I'd be careful. I'd be careful. Uh, Lavendi, if you could find a period of time when it's not going to be quite as um, not quite as hot, uh, that would be good. Um, whenever I did the video for Celsius and Certainty, um, I sprayed this in July, which was in 90s in Georgia, and there was no, there wasn't a problem. Um, so if you already have sedge hammer, use that. Given that you have St. Augustine and you're trying to take target sedges, I would use Certainty for sedges over sedge hammers. If you don't, if you already have it, use what you got. But if you don't have it, and you're looking for a product to target sedges. I would use this over um, sedge hammer if you have warm season turf. And it's, it, that's gonna be fine on St. Augustine. Okay, next is uh, Jonathan. He says, I'm using all liquid products. I'm also adding iron as well. I'm using the T-Jet Spray fan tip for application. Yeah, so if you're using, I mean, look at the label for the products you're using. If, if the stuff that you're referring to are the products that we carry on the golf course lawn store, so like the Carbon Kit, Primo, um, uh, Turf Plex, uh, Bloom Plex, like all those are Nutrizolve, all those are designed to be, you spray them and just leave them on the lawn. You don't have to run irrigation um, after you're done applying them. So you can, you would spray them and then if you want, if your normal time to irrigate the lawn is the next day, you can run that. But I, what I would not do is spray them and run irrigation right after. In other words, they do not need to be watered in. They do not need to be watered in. Uh, Tristan M says, seed heads. Yeah, seed heads are a thing. Um, so it's a normal, it's a normal part of the life cycle of your grass. So whenever the, the lawn, typically you see them whenever the lawn is transitioning from cooler temperatures to warmer temperatures, if you have Bermuda grass or zoysia, that's when you see them a lot. In most lawns, it is, it is normally a few weeks. So two to three week problem, assuming the lawn is getting enough water and assuming, um, enough water and enough, um, nutrients. So assuming, assuming that the, the turf is otherwise healthy, uh, it's, it, they don't tend to stick around too long. Something you can do to help suppress seed heads and make them stand out less is to use a growth regulator like Primo Max. Um, that, I mean, people think about growth regulator as, you know, to stop your lawn from growing so fast, but yes, but it also a benefit to them as well is seed head suppression. So if you, um, you can just wait, Tristan, it's, they're still going to be a thing. If you mow your lawn more frequently, they're still going to be a thing. If you mow lower, they're still going to grow. They're not going to, you won't see them. Um, if you mow shorter, what's going to happen is they're still going to be a thing, but they will, um, they're just going to grow and grow cr closer to the, uh, to the surface. So there's, so they may not look as ugly versus having these long seed heads sticking up and, you know, having the, the seed head like flaring out. They're still going to be there, but they may not look as bad. But the ways for, to um, make it not last as long as possible, uh, to make it last as short as possible, is to again ensure your lawn is getting enough water, ensure that your nutrient program is on point, and then to also suppress how much you have and at all use uh, use Primo, use use a growth regulator. That will um, that will help. And you say they they usually look white um, white to, though to me. Yeah, I mean that's they, that's how they're they're supposed to look. And again, it's. They, they, if you're mowing your if you're mowing your lawn, um, if you mow your lawn shorter, you're still gonna have seed heads, but they, they, they're not gonna you're not they're not gonna visually they're not gonna look as ugly. Is what I'm trying to say. Water, nutrients, time is what I'm gonna say. That that's gonna be your uh, your your best thing. Jay Mooney says, "What do you recommend for killing weeds? Depends. Depends on your grass type. Depends on the weeds you're trying to target. I can give you a couple of options. So I will uh, we can walk through it really quick. So if you go to the golf course lawn store, and then you go to shop and you go to the ocean. We have 
So when it comes to post-emergent herbicides, they broadly fall into two categories. Ones that are safe for warm season grass, ones that are safe for cool season grass, and then there are, really there's a third category that are ones that you can spray on both. For, for warm season grass, like Bermuda, Zoysia, St. Augustine, pretty much everything other than Bahia grass, the, a combination of herbicides that I am a huge fan of are Celsius and Certainty. Celsius is very good for broad leaves. It targets a ton of broad leaves. Um, and then Certainty is very good for sedges, sedges and poanias. So some of your more grassy weeds um, like sedges and then your broad leaves like with, uh, with Celsius, that combination is very good for controlling weeds in warm season turf. The nice thing about these two is that you can spray them over a broad temperature range. So when it's cooler in you know the spring, they still work. And when it's warmer, this time of year it's getting hotter, you can still spray them with the least chance of there being discoloration in your lawn. Like if you go out and you spray on a day when it's you know 100 degrees out, anything you spray is likely gonna cause some discoloration. So I would say one, just don't spray when it's that hot out. Um, but these two, this combination, is, um, is it kills, it does a great job controlling weeds while also minimizing damage to your grass. So you can buy them a la carte. Um, I recommend with either of them, whether you're using Celsius or Certainty, that at a minimum you use surfactant along with it. This is gonna help enhance um, how well the, the herbicide works. You're gonna get a better, you can get better control of the weeds you're trying to target. Celsius again is for broad leaves, Certainty is for sedges and mix them with surfactant. If you want to save um, time as far as being to add stuff to the cart and also save a bit of money, we have a kit that has Celsius, Certainty, Marker Dye, and surfactant. So it's cheaper than buying them individually. Um, and uh, in the product video, in the, in, the, in the description here, there's a video that shows how I like to use these. It's not the only way you can use them. There's, other, there's, a, there's a broad range of application rates, but the rates that I show in this video work well and produce um, produce a good result in the testing that I've done. They could do a good job controlling the weeds while minimizing um, you know discoloration to your turf. But it is for warm season grass only. Hence, you see the big orange banner there: warm season grass only for warm season grass. Do not spray it on rye, fescue, or Kentucky bluegrass. You will have a bad day. For cool season grass you have Tenacity and Sedge Hammer. Tenacity is kind of a specialty herbicide. It's really good, especially if you're planning on doing like seeding projects and you want something that can not only control weeds, um, but also um, suppress the chances for weeds to grow for a short period of time. Tenacity is really good for that. And then Sedge Hammer fits the place or takes the place that Certainty does in warm season turf. So S Sedge Hammer is safe for both warm season and cool season grass. But in my opinion, it does not work as well on um, as sedge ha as a as certainty. So if you have warm season grass, Bermuda, Zoysia, or St. Augustine, and you're trying to control sedges, certainty is what you want to use. If you have um, you know if you have a cool season lawn or you have a blend, because there's some people that have lawns that have um, a portion of the lawn that is Bermuda and a portion that has, is like fescue, like the shaded more shaded areas. In a case like that. That is where sedge hammer is a is a better fit because that sedge hammer you can spray on warm and cool season turf, whereas certainty you would not want to do that. It will injure and or kill it. So this and these two again, along with marker dye and surfactant, are what come in um, the cool season kit that we have. That is for cool season grass. The only warm season grasses that you can. Um, that were tenacity, which again is designed for cool season grass. It's, it's primarily for cool season grass, where you I would where you can spray it, where you can use it, is if you are spraying, if you're trying to target, say, uh, crabgrass in a centipede lawn, then tenacity can be used for that. Um, the label calls it, says that it can be used on St. Augustine, but really it's St. Augustine that's not on residential lawn. So as far as like residential use of tenacity in a warm season grass. The pure the only one you really would want to be using it on um, is a centipede. And that's only if you're targeting crabgrass. If you're not targeting crabgrass, then this is a better than the than Celsius and certainty. Like this, this kit is a better, better choice. Now, so we've covered the only, we've covered the, the options that are only for warm season, the options that are only for cool season. Now we can talk about some of the blends that will work for warm and cool season. So for that, you have um, a product like Triad. Often, these, these types of products are often called like three ways. So like um, Spectracide, eh, it's not technically a three way, but I mean, you could consider it, it's, kind of, it's three way esque. Um, or you have something like Triad, which can be sprayed on warm season um, grass and cool season grass. And it contains um, a, you know, a, couple, a, a couple different uh, a couple different herbicides, like a combination, like a blend of, of, of herbicides, hence why it's called oftentimes a three-way, right? 
Um, it's this is good if all you're trying to do is knock out like an easy easy to kill weeds like uh, like dandelions. Uh, triad will work for that. If you're trying to kill clover, triad will work for that. Um, you do, the thing with this I'd, I'd want to be careful of is as temperatures get warmer, you want to be careful using a product like this. So whereas if you were, had a day when it's going to be like in the mid 80s, I would, and you're trying to control broadleafs, I would, while triad could work, I would feel much more comfortable using Celsius for that versus triad. So it just, so that that's um that gives you like a, a quick primer, at least as far as the products that we that we carry. There's there's a bunch of other products that that will kill cool season that, that are that are safer, cool season grass, warm season grass. But as far as what we carry on the golf course lawn store, um, those are the ones that are in each category. So you got cool season only, warm season only, and then a blend that is not quite as good as the ones that are only for cool season and only for warm season. Um, but they they do fit the bill, or they do they do fit up salt. Um, they do like solve a problem for people that have like blended lawns, or people that just they're like, hey, I, I'll deal with a little bit of discoloration. I don't want to spend the money that you know that Celsius or certain that, that Celsius costs, so I'll use um, something like Triad instead. So hopefully that helps, uh, Jay Mooney. So as you can see, right, it's not as easy as just saying this product. The answer is it depends. The best answer is it depends. Depends on what kind of grass you have, what kind of weeds you're trying to target, but hopefully the, my explanation there um, helps you out as far as options for controlling weeds in your lawn. Um, let's see here. Uh, the Yeet says, can you explain the science or logic behind why grass gets denser the more you mow and how can grass spread to the side or fill in patches if there are no seed present? It's a good question. So take a grass like Bermuda, right? Well, it's a grass that um, that in many ways is a is is a is a creeping grass, right? So it, it can spread beneath the surface with rhizomes, and it can also spread from um, from stolons. It can it can it can extend its reach from from surface runners. So if you think about what a what a, what a grass with a leaf of grass is trying to do, right? It's trying to catch sunlight, so for to help with chlorophyll um, and to 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 power to power all the the processes within the plant, right? So if you take a Bermuda lawn, if you ever look at a Bermuda lawn that's allowed to grow to like three inches or four inches to get really to get really long, what you tend to see is the lawn gets, the grass is longer, but it tends to get be what we call leggy or thin, right? So it's, it's the grass is taller, but it looks thin. It doesn't really look that good. And if you think about it, there's no reason for the grass to get dense because the Bermuda is living its best life. It's nice and tall. There's plenty of leaf. There's tons of tons of leaf all over the place to catch sunlight. So there's no reason for it to really spread a lot and to get get to get thick. Now, if you take the same grass, Bermuda, which, which can tolerate being cut at shorter mowing heights and you mow it frequently, what tends to happen is the grass, instead of being able to grow tall, it adapts from the fact that it can't grow tall by spreading, right? Because it's thinking to itself, I mean, grass doesn't think, but it's but essentially what's happening is the grass is saying to itself, this crazy person keeps cutting me off all the time. I'm trying to go tall. I'm trying to catch the leaf. I'm trying to get sunlight. I'm trying to, you know, make chlorophyll. I'm trying to live my best life here. And this guy keeps cutting me off. So instead of trying to grow up, I'm going to start spreading out. And that's what causes it to spread out and get denser and get thicker. Not all grasses do this. Like, um, like you have some grasses that are like your more bunching grasses, like like fescues. Like they don't spread the same way that um, that Bermuda does, which is why you find that people that have like a fescue lawn in the springtime, if they're trying to get it to get thicker, that's why overseeding like uh, cool season lawns is very much more a thing than warm season lawns. Like if, like with um, Bermuda, there really isn't a need to to overseed it from a standpoint of trying to get it to thicken up and spread. So mowing it by 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 mowing the lawn frequently, you are training it to try and grow to grow laterally than to grow up. If your grass is a type that does that, so for, for Bermuda, if you grow let a Bermuda lawn and get really tall. It'll, I mean, it'll grow fine that way, but it's just not going to look very good. So, um, so hopefully that makes sense as far as if you, if the more you mow, uh, if you mow Bermuda shorter with sharp equipment, you are going to encourage it to spread, to, to grow out, to grow laterally, then grow up. So, um, due to the, due to the, the growth characteristics of the, of the grass type. So, and you said, how does you, how can the grass spread to the side and fill in patches if there's no seeds present? For the reasons that I explained, as far as as far as like um, Bermuda goes, if you're talking about like a fescue, then yeah, that's one where you're going to want to use seed or sod to help that area to um, to to fill in to fill in. If you have Saint Augustine, it's the same thing. Saint Augustine also spreads very aggressively. Um, it's 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 like Bermuda in that in that um in that regard. In that with Saint Augustine, 
Um, one, there's not really any grass seed for St. Augustine. It's not really a thing. Um, but if you mow it regularly, right, if you're mowing it, you're going to encourage that lateral growth and you get this really thick, dense lawn um, from regular mowing. You know what I mean? So I so hope that helps the yeet. I hope my explanation makes sense is that because grass wants sunlight and to get sunlight, it needs leaf. And to get in for, the, for there to be leaf to catch sunlight, you can't be cutting it off all the time. It, if you cut it at shorter heights, you're going to encourage it to grow uh, laterally, that laterally to spread out, which is also part of the reason why, like a grass, like um, like a fescue, doesn't like being cut short because it doesn't, it can't adapt the way that Bermuda can. Um, so if you cut it short, you're 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 injuring it. You know what I mean? It doesn't, it doesn't, it can't adapt like the way Bermuda can. All right. So hope that helps, sir. If you have Bermuda, just mow it a whole lot. Make sure it gets plenty of sunlight. Make sure it has enough fertilizer. But mowing, a lot of mowing is the thing that's going to help it or encourage it to spread laterally in your lawn. All right, next up is Ryan Mortison. Uh, Ryan Mortison, he says, um, I'm getting ready to make my first application of growth regulator. Yay for that. That's awesome. I also have some spurs popping up. Can Celsius and Tnex... Um, be applied together, or should they be applied separately? Uh, yeah, you can spray them at the same time. Um, the thing I would say is, I I am not a fan of also mixing surfactant if you're spraying Primo. So if you're if you're spraying a growth regulator, um, I would forego. Um, if you're spraying for, for, for growth regulator along with Celsius, I would forego the um, the surfactant. That's the only adjustment that I would make. But yeah, you can mix them together and they can they can be sprayed at the same time. Uh, Nathan Merrill is up next. Uh, he says, I put down half an application of Primo Max on, on my perennial ryegrass up north. It rained 45 minutes later. I don't know if it's not rained fast in an hour. Typically needs a little bit more than an hour. Uh, do you think it all washed off or would it work some? Thanks, Ron. I mean, you'll likely get some benefit, but it's not going to be as good as if you allowed it to completely dry. You know what I mean? So if you did it at half rate, just let it, I, what I would not do is this, I wouldn't go out and spray again, because in the event that it, it that a, most of it was allowed to dry on the plant before it, um, before it started raining, you don't want to over apply it. So two weeks from now, 15 days from now, do another application and then just, just move on. You know what I mean? So if it, if you don't get as good um, regulation this time around, because you didn't get as much of it into the plant as you, as it needed, so be it such as life. 15 days from now, you can spray again because you're doing like a half rate application and you can just make sure you time it for your next app when there's not rain in the immediate forecast. If you give it four hours, I think the, I think the label actually calls, gives, says less time than that, but if you give it four hours, that really should be enough on a, on a day when it's, when it's dry for Primo to, um, to, to, um, to be rain fast, to be, to be good to go. All right, next up is Lavendi. He says, thanks, fine, sir. The sedges are bad every year, so I'll buy a certainty since the hammer isn't really laying down the hammer. Yeah, I mean, so as far as sedges go, there is, because I've, I've, I'll tell you, I've tried, here's what I've used before for, for sedges. I've tried, I've tried sedge hammer. I've used um, image, which can work. I've used the, um, the ortho product, which also can work. Um, and then I've used certainty and this by far, by far is the best stuff by far. I mean, and the thing is, it doesn't even take that much. So if you're spraying sedges, you know, three, three to four scoops with two gallons of water, a bit of surfactant, and it will, you know, especially this, this time of year when the, when the temps are warmer, it will absolutely decimate sedges. It's, it's an awesome product for that. And it's not going to discolor your lawn in the process. The, the other, probably the second place product that I would give for sedges, for taking care of sedges that works um, relatively quickly, um, that Orthene product, which is actually a big box or product, does pretty well against sedges. It works fairly quickly, but it also discolors your grass. It also discolors your grass pretty, um, you know, I think fairly badly whenever you you use it um, for sedge control. So if you have warm season turf, just buy certainty. Like this is what I would use. Just this, if you got a warm season grass, you got Bermuda, Soja, St. Augustine, use this. This is, this is a better, this is, it, again, from my testing, the best um, product for, for taking care of sedges in a warm season lawn. Really good product. Really like certainty. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. And then um, Doug is chiming in. He says, at the yeed, it's similar to hair. The more dense, the more you cut it, the denser it'll grow. Yep. That's another way of saying it. Uh, next up, we got Tristan Norman and use a grass killer to dig them up. Or is there another option that won't hurt Bermuda? Yes, Tristan. That's a good, yeah, so yeah, so a couple things you can do. You can wait until 
you can do that. You can't wait till the lawn goes or is going dormant to get rid of the fescue. That's one approach. Or you can use a selective herbicide. So this is a this is a perfect example, right? So when remember I was talking about herbicides, how they come in three broad categories, ones that are safe for warm season grass, warm, or at least post-emergence post -emergence anyway. Ones that are safe for warm season grass, ones that are safe for cool season grass, and the ones that can be used on both. So turns out the, if, a, if a herbicide is safe for warm season grass, logic would dictate that it is not safe for cool season grass, right? So if you spray a warm season, uh, a cool, a warm, a cool season uh, um, grass with a herbicide that is safe for warm season turf, you're going to injure, injure and or kill it. This is why we use, I'll show you here real quick. This is why like if for people that overseed their Bermuda grass lawns with uh, perennial rye grass, why they spray their Bermuda lawn with Celsius in the springtime to get rid of the rye grass because Celsius is safe for B Bermuda, but it is not safe for rye. It is not safe for Kentucky bluegrass and it is not safe for fescue. So if you want to get rid of the fescue in your um, in your Bermuda lawn, you could use Celsius. You could probably use either of these, Celsius or Certainty. I don't I don't know which of them will honestly work better. If you if you're telling me ryegrass, I would say Celsius. I I've not heard of. I don't know what people use. Um, I I mean either of them will work. I'm not sure which one is going to be more effective against fescue. Um, uh, you know, because uh, I know again I, I I'm familiar with ryegrass and Celsius is really good for that. Either one of these should do the trick. I mean, if you are if you want to use, if you have both of them, you could spray a blend and spray both of them. And that, that will get rid of your, that will kill the fescue in your lawn while not harming the Bermuda. Um, because a thing to think about too, is if you're gonna wait until, if you're gonna wait until the Bermuda goes dormant, that's really, I mean, it's really like, depending on where you are in the country, November. November timeframe. So that's a long time to wait to get rid of the of the, the fescue in your lawn. So I would just spray your spray the fescue with um, a herbicide that is safe for warm season grass like Celsius or Certainty or both of them. And that will, your Bermuda and should tolerate that or it will tolerate that just fine. And the fescue will not. The fescue that will that will seriously injure and or kill it. Uh, so that is what I would do. And the benefit to doing it now as well too, Tristan, is that if you do it now while Bermuda is actively growing, is once the fescue is dead and you get rid of it, you can, now the Bermuda, because it, it's still growing, can spread into that area or you can plug that area where the fescue used to be and it can fill in, you know what I mean? So there's, that's another reason, that's another benefit of doing it while the Bermuda is actively growing. So I would do it now. I wouldn't wait until Bermuda goes dormant because you're going to be waiting a long time and um, there's options for doing it safely now. All right, uh, Elevated Time says, what do you think of Oasis Bermuda Grass Seed Blend? Don't know, I'm ne I've never heard of it until right now. I'm thinking of overseeding my lawn with it. I've never, I'll actually look it up. I'll take a screenshot of it and I'll check, check it out after the show is over. How about that? I'll promise you that. I'll take a look at it and, and when we can use it as a talking point for, uh, for next week. But I've never, um, never heard of it until now, so I don't know. Next up is your friend. He says, um, your friend. Hi, Ron. Thank you for taking the time and helping the lawn community. I appreciate it, man. It's a lot of fun. As If you guys don't or can't tell, I mean, there's other things I could be doing on a Sunday. So, and, and outside of mowing my lawn, I enjoy like hanging out with you guys and you know answering questions and just, just, just figuring out what's going on with you guys in your lawn a whole lot. Hence why I'm not like watching soccer or what, doing that right now. I'm sitting here hanging out and watching, uh, hanging out, talking to you guys. You are very welcome, uh, The Yeet. And uh, let's see, Grant Gray is up next. He says, good afternoon, everyone. It's afternoon already? Yeah, I gotta wrap this up soon. I gotta run to the airport. Um, this is, I uh, got my soil test results. I'm low in phosphorus, high in sulfur, and low in micronutrients. Okay, um, I have Bermuda lawn in upstate South Carolina. How do I correct it? Um, what you can do is, so you're, wait, wait, you need, you need, Weren't you on the live stream? Weren't you on the live stream on Friday? I thought I answered this question already. So if you're low in phosphorus, high in sulfur, low in micronutrients, so you can use you can use a phosphate product because there's a there's a triple a product called I think it's called triple phosphate that you can use if all you care about is raising your phosphorus levels um, in your lawn from the mac from a macro standpoint, and then from micros you can use a um, a micronutrient like Nutrizolve to bring them up. Let me let me see if I can find that. So I can find the phosphate. I think it's a triple. 
Yeah, triple, triple super phosphate. It's not just triple, it's triple and super and phosphate. It's a cool name, good branding. Uh, yeah, so you could use something like this. You could use something like this. I think I've already shown it here. Uh, yeah, something like this for the for the phosphorus, for the phosphorus efficiency. Uh, Grant, and I'll link it here for you in the chat. So at Grant Gray. Uh, so for phosphorus, you could use, so phos, uh, correction, you could use this. Um, and then, uh, and then you also, and then for your micronutrients, if all you care about is micronutrients, you could use a product like Nutrizolve. So if you went to shop and then lawn fertilizer and then micronutrients, you got like a, you got this product Nutrizolve. Like this can be used to correct your, your micronutrient levels. Um, you know, what I, if it were me, what I would do is all this does have, I think there is some sulfur in this. What I would use is something um, like, like, um, like the complete because let me see here, how much sulfur is in the complete? Let us see, let us see how much sulfur is in here. Uh, 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 there is, uh, my, my, my mouse is in the wrong spot. All right, there is, uh, I can't move this up to see it. Hang on, make this, make, make the screen bigger. All right, there is how much sulfur? Yeah, there's six percent sulfur in this. So yeah, so if your sulfur is very high, you might not want to you might not want to use this because you're gonna be you're gonna be raising those levels. Um, so yeah, so some kind of a balanced fertilizer like this can work. So you could use this. You could also use um, let me see the triple twelve from Yard Mastery. Like this, you could also use. I don't believe there's a, there's a lot of phosphorus in this guy, um, but yeah, this is an option as well. I can't zoom in that yeah so yeah there isn't i don't see phosphorus on the label for the for this guy um so yeah so this this could be an option this could be your jam um grant gray you could use that triple phos or you could use this which also has micronutrients in it as well so and grant gray you could go with this guy this is also a good fit for your for your lawn um if you did not have high sulfate or high sulfur levels um i would have used the complete the 14714 um but I, in lieu of that you could use this triple this triple 12 product so i i think that came across okay yep so i hope that helps sir if you need anything else definitely let me know i think that works let me see if this is is clickable. No, it's the, the it's too long. Anyway, uh, you, you'll go to this page. I'll, I'll give you the link to the uh, to the collection, the fertilizer collection, and just go to page two, Grant, because it'll be, that's where it'll be. Okay, next is Papa Mo's Low. It says, would you recommend for Conclorac for centipede creeping into Bermuda? Yes, that's a great option. If you want to get rid of Bermuda, if you want to get rid of centipede or St. Augustine in Bermuda grass, Conclorac is a great option for that. Um, yes, Papa Moslo, I would. Uh, next is Chase Thompson. He says, I sent you, he says, hey, Ron, I sent you an email with the progress I've made on my lawn. Thanks for all your help. Let me see if I can find it here really quick. Chase, I, uh, let's see here. I don't know if I've got you an email. Let me see. And hopefully you sent me a picture that's not too big. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I can I can download these. I can I can show I could show folks these, why not? Call it Chase, and, cause I think you guys like to see them. It's kind of cool. Show some top dressing in here too, which makes for a lot of fun. And they're not, the pictures, the images aren't too big. Let me make sure I can show them in the right order. Uh, last, okay. So, this is uh, Chase's, um, the, 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 project or the um the progress he's made in his lawn so this is picture one you can see he did some top dressing there uh that was when it was um that's a picture a high shot a high um pic, uh, uh, shot of it this is another image of of his top dressing his top dressing work looks like you went i don't just want to say super heavy but you definitely went you definitely were had a low spot there in the middle chase looks like you went kind of heavy there and then this is Let's see here, this is his lawn. I didn't have these queued up ahead of time. So this is how, how it's growing through the top dressing. If I can get it to load. So this is a, a bit a bit of time has passed. 
looking pretty good. Like it's recovering nicely there. I get you off, off here. This look is recovering very nicely. So from that to that, that's a very nice recovery chase. And then finally, this is a picture, I believe the most recent one of how it looks now. So you can still see some areas with some sand popping through, but that looks, looks really good. Nice man, nice work. Appreciate you sending me the pictures, looks good. Keep it up, it's gonna get even better as you, um, as you continue working on it. It's gonna get even better as you continue working on it. All right, uh, next. Um, next up is Omar Garcia. He says, wait, why don't you recommend surfactant with PGR? Uh, Cause it's not necessary. You don't, you don't need it. Um, I have clay soil. So my logic has always been anything to help break surface tension and get liquid into the dirt. Well, the uh, thing is Omar is that, uh, that Primo, uh, Primo is um, absorbed via the foliar. You can think of it almost by the, the, the leaf of the plant. You can think of it almost like you putting lotion on your on your skin, right? Like you don't, you wouldn't, you not a, think of like a soil a, a soil based product as something you ingest, like you eat, and then like um, Primo or other uh, foliar based for products are like a lotion, something you spray on the skin of the plant, on the on the leaf of the plant. So because the goal of this is not to get it in the soil, right? This is not a soil-based product. It's not, you're not supposed to water this in. Um, you don't want to, you don't, uh, and even if you were gonna use surfactant like um, like a spreader sticker, you won't you don't use that with this. It's not, it's not necessary. You don't need surfactant whenever you use um, Primo. And be, because it's soil, you're talking about a soil-based product, um, this isn't soil-based, like you don't, this doesn't work by via soil. There are growth regulators. Like there's one that I used to use many years ago, but you can't use it anymore, unfortunately. Um, uh, pack, it's, the active ingredient is paclobutrazole. Paclobutrazole. Um, and uh, under the name, I think it's called Tide Paclo. That was one, there's, there's other companies that make that, that, that sell it too. But, um, but Tide Paclo, now that is a growth regulator that is soil based. Um, but not not primo. This stuff you do not you don't you don't water it in. It doesn't work from the soil. You want to get it on the plant leaf and allow it to dry. And you don't need to use surfactant along with it. Not necessary. Hope that helps. All right. Next up is McNasty Motorsports. He says, "I just finished a mow. I'm a mess. <laughs> uh, Chase Mrs. McNasty around, threatening to give her a sweaty hug. Told her Ron said it's it's good for the for the good of the grass." I did not, Mrs. McNasty, if you're watching this, I didn't want to, I want to go on record that I did not tell this man who just finished mowing his lawn. I did tell him to mow his lawn. That part is true. Um, I, I did not at, at any point tell him to come chase you around and give you a sweaty hug because it's good for the grass. I did not, did not say that. I've said a lot of things. That's not one of them. I didn't say that. I'm not trying to get in trouble. I don't want her coming after me. All right. Next up we have, uh, um, hyphen uh, sword. He says, I used image to kill sedges in my fescue lawn and it killed the grass. So now I use image to kill annual bluegrass in my flower beds. Yeah. So that's another great example of a herbicide that is designed is safe for warm season grass. Like image is designed to be, to be applied to Bermuda and zoysia, warm season grass types, but it is not safe for cool season grasses. If you, if you, you spray image on a lawn, that is cool season, you're gonna you're gonna have the result that you have, right? It's gonna kill it's gonna kill the lawn. So in your case, it did it did what it it did it produced a non-desirable result, but it did what it's designed to do. It's designed to kill um, sedges and also it's not safe for cool season grasses. So I'm not surprised that that happened. Hyphen and whoever was that was that asked the question about removing the fescue, who was it? Was this the yeet? Who was it? No, it was uh, Tristan. So Tristan, so as an example, a living example of using a selective herbicide that is designed for warm season turf. If you if you apply that to a cool season lawn, the results you will have, right? It's gonna kill it. All right, so next up, we are winding down here. We got uh, Alfredo Martinez, he's up next. He says, my brother bought a house with a yard that's 100% just weeds, or practically 100% weeds. So not sure what the grass is or even on the property. Should he just buy new sod or kill the weeds and seed? I would kill it. I would do to answer your question, sod. I would do sod. So you know, I would I would clean up the weeds, kill off the weeds in the lawn, and then do sod. That's going to be faster, especially if your brother's not really into you know lawn care and he doesn't you know he's not in love with the process of growing a lawn from seed. Sod, he's going to be a lot happier with because um, with sod you go from bare dirt to having a lawn, and that's what most people want. They want they want their lawn. <laughs> they want it sooner versus you know the three weeks a month 
to start seeing germination for certain grass types and even longer for it to, fu to fully fill in. Uh, he's going to be a lot happier if he nukes the existing grass and then installs uh, whatever he wants via sod. That's gonna, That's what I would say to do. It's going to be a better way to go. And let me see, we are winding down. And then um, next up, we said hyphen sources for sedges and fescue lawns. I only use sedge hammer. Hence, like what I said, right? When I was when I had my little section there where I was talking about cool season or or what herbicides to use, sedge hammer. If you got if you have a cool season lawn, this is a, a great product. Or if you have a blended lawn, so you have like some parts of your lawn that are cool season, some parts that are warm season, get sedge hammer because you can spray it on both, right? But if all you have is warm season, get certainty. It is better in my opinion. It's a better product for um, for warm season, for warm season turf. Very, very good. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Um, and then next up, you're very welcome, Grant Gray. And then Elevated Times says, um, Oasis is Chile Verde, Maya, and Transcontinental. Cool. I've never heard of Chile Verde. So uh, I have heard of Maya and I've heard of Trans Transcontinental, but I've not heard of Chile Verde. Cool. Yeah, I'll have to look into it, man. Ele elevated times. It sounds like um, sounds like it could be cool. Could be a nice, uh, a, a nice, uh, a nice blend. But uh, yeah, well, guys, gals, I just wanted to you know hang out with you guys, pass some time, and talk about some lawn care stuff. And um, three and a half hours later, we have come to the end of the show. We have come to the uh, to the end of the show. Um, John Carter here on Instagram, you're saying, hey, I emailed you some pictures of my uh, unlevel lawn a couple weeks ago. I just emailed you more pics of the first leveling. What's next? I'll take a look, John, and I will answer you. I'll send you an email once you're done so um, to make sure that you get your answer. So fair or not, fair or not, no worries. And with all that, hopefully you guys are going to get to go out and play in the lawn today. I'm not because of all the rain that we've had. And uh, hopefully it was, a, it was a good use of your time. Hopefully the three hours you spent with me, or if you were just, you stepped in and out for a little while, that the little time you were here was a good return on your time. And I will, uh, I will see you guys next week. Thank you so much for, for watching. Take care. Go have some fun in your lawn.